Hi, and welcome. I'm your host, Michelle Merchant Johnson with Love Life Coaching, and I'm thrilled and honored to have a returning guest with us today, and that is the amazing Dr. John Gray. Welcome, John. I'm so happy to be with you again. So happy to be with you, and I just can't wait to interview on this topic because I know it's such an important topic and on the minds of so many women out there. And before we jump in, I do want to just give a little formal introduction. I know for so many of you, John is a household name. His uh, most well-known and trusted relationship book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, is listed as one of the top 10 most influential books of the last quarter century. And I was just saying to John before we started, that when I look at his body of work, all of these books behind him and all of the work that he's done in the world, the impact that he's had in the world has been so in tremendous and must be very deeply satisfying. And I know in my own work, in my own relationship, uh, Dr. Gray has made a huge difference and I'm really grateful for you and grateful for that and thankful for the opportunity to interview you again. Dr. Gray's books are translated into approximately 45 languages and more than 100 countries, and it continues to be a, a bestseller, which is really amazing since it came out when? The 90s? Yeah, early 90s. Yeah. And Dr. Gray has written over 20 books. His most recent book is Beyond Mars and Venus. I have that one right here. His Mars Venus book series has forever changed the way men and women view their relationships. And we're going to be talking about some of the things that uh, women are asking me quite frequently in my own work, because I work mainly with single women, usually a little more mature single women, 40, 50 and above, who may have been very successful in life, but have maybe struggled some in the area of relationships. And one of the questions they often ask is, well, they ask questions all the time about men and why men do certain things, but they ask this question about how a man chooses a woman, what makes him want to commit to a woman, what makes him want to stay with a woman or choose a particular woman for their long-term relationship, wife or girlfriend. And so I want to hear your perspective on that, John. Well, I, what comes up in my mind is, <clears throat> and this may not apply fully to men above 50, uh, but it can. All right. It just, I'm remembering myself back when I realized I wanted to get married. All right. First thing is when I, when I, as a younger man, if I can't support myself, I can't think about committing to another woman. And then there's another aspect where a man has low self esteem. This wasn't me, but it's one of my clients. He had low self esteem. He's always telling her, she's saying, I want to get married. It gives me a sense of security. And we could talk more about conversations to motivate motivate a man to say, I'll get married. Because you need to have conversations if he doesn't do it. So that's one thing. And I had a client and they've been together for 10 years and he loved her dearly. And he says, you can find somebody better than me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she says, no, you're the one. And he says, I love you. I don't want to marry you because I feel like you deserve somebody better than me. And this is just understanding male psychology. It's about feeling I can be successful in providing what you need and want. And he just didn't feel he could do that. Now he had his own blocks and securities, but she also had contributed to it. And unknowingly, it was an experience when they were visiting Los Angeles at Beverly Hills, and they were looking at all these mansions. <laughs> and so this is a long time ago, but it's a there was a movie at the time called The Beverly Hillbillies. And they lived in mansions, these hillbillies. And they were going around these mansions and she was like adoring the, oh my gosh, a swimming pool. Could you imagine having a swimming pool with a diving board, you know, and oh my gosh. So he was watching her feel so happy by looking at all of that. He had this experience that he could never provide that and she deserved better. He loved her so much. So. Now, she didn't know that that had happened. Uh, I had researched asking questions about their life and so forth. And somehow that came up that they, some of the vacations they went on. And I realized that's probably what happened because she really liked those houses. Anyway, so I told her, uh, get him to take you to this movie because the movie was happening at that time. It was the movie, not the TV show, but something about Down and Out Beverly Hills. 
So I said, go to the movie, and when you leave the movie, casually say, you know, those big houses are amazing and beautiful, but I would never really want to live in any of that. I'm just happy with simple life. And a week later, he proposed to her, and, and they got married. Uh, so he just needed a message that he was enough. And it's so much about men is to feel the confidence that I can provide. Now, for me, all in my own experience, here's a younger guy when I wasn't making a lot of money. Actually, I was homeless for a while. I'd been a monk and then I was homeless and then I finally built my career. I didn't want to have children. But as soon as I started wanting to, uh, wanting, making enough money, then suddenly I wanted to have children. And when a man wants to have children, that's often when they're younger, the big motivator to get married. Okay, so there is a place there, which is some men in their 30s and early 40s don't want to get married because they're not yet really feeling good enough to raise a family. And today it's very expensive to raise a family. So those are just some dynamics, just that some stories that come to my mind. The The reality though, in com- having a conversation with men, men are very reasonable. And why get married? You know, you're 50 years old, you're 45 years old, you're beyond the rate, the, the, the time of having children. Now, having said that, uh, every woman has a great conversation she can have with a guy, which is, if we're going to have children, I need to feel secure. And I trust you in my conscious mind, okay? But I have insecurities. We all have insecurities. So you have to own this. Just say, you know, I have insecurities. And if we're married, then I feel more secure. Because when you get married, it's more difficult to run away. Because we all have our emo- at difficult times. We have fight or flight, and we can just sort of run away. So in the, it's rather embarrassing if you love your partner in front of all your friends and your family and the world and you have a divorce and then having to divide everything up by the law, mm-hmm. it's more complicated. And so it's not so easy to just leave. And that makes us, if we love each other, feel the commitment to make it work and do what it takes to make it work. As human beings, we have a tendency to just want to do what's easy. And when you're not getting along, you know, we all have these periods of ups and downs. And at those times, it's inevitable. Then at those times when things are a little challenging or difficult, we just, well, and this is what men do. They think, well, if you're not happy, then why should we have a relationship? And this is understanding men is that a healthy man depends on himself to be happy. A healthy woman depends on herself to be happy. But more so for women, it's, depending upon the conditions of your life, your your home, your children, your friends, your education, uh, your relationships with God, there's a lot of elements that go towards relationships. Those are all relationships that can provide happiness for a woman. A woman's baseline of happiness should come from all of those kinds of relationships, but not dependent on a man. Ideally, she depends on the man to take her to not happy, but happier. It's a real key thing, okay? If you're just going to look to a man to make you happy and he's to be in and end all of your life and you can't live without him, it's going to be a very unhealthy relationship. And and you'll, she will come across as needy. And neediness will keep him from wanting to marry you. The, the neediness, needing, these are challenging words to understand, but it's needy is saying, I need more and you're not giving it to me. Needing is I'm happy to be with you. I'm enjoying myself. I'm so glad I'm with you. It's it's a joyful response as a, as a message to man that I need you. I miss you, okay? When she says, I miss you, I, I need you. But again, even tone of voice can convey uh, uh, that I miss you and I'm not, I can't live without you. That's not good, okay? It's, it'd be like if you're texting him, you'd say something like, and texting is now a good way of communicating little messages when you're apart. You know, it's just, just, I miss you. I had the best lunch today with my friend Carol. I had coffee that was like spectacular. I never, it was a latte that was amazing. So you, you have to put it in the context of I miss you, my life is great, as opposed to I miss you and I'm at home alone and nothing to do and nobody cares about me. See, there's a, a victim mentality that comes across as I'm not, I can get what I need from you and I'm unhappy, as opposed to I'm doing good and I can be better. See, mm-hmm. there's a dynamic there that makes you way more attracted to him. But I'm, I'm coming back to the moment where I 
I was married before I married Bonnie, and then I'm, Bonnie has passed, and now I'm married again. So I know a lot of different stages of, of getting married, but I'll build up to it because they're all important insights to understand men. And please interrupt me if you have questions on any of this, Michelle, as I'm going. Before you go into your story, and I want to hear about your um, experiences because I think it's incredibly valuable, but I just want to put the explanation point on what you just said about needing and neediness because I think that is something that is so confusing to so many women, John, because we keep hearing this message, men need to feel needed. They need to feel like they have something to offer, to contribute. They need to feel like they can be successful, like you were saying. And yet then on the other hand, we're like, but you can't be needy. And so the way you described it, it almost felt like, and, and maybe this isn't quite right, so you can uh, correct me if, if there's a nuance to this I'm not getting, but it almost felt like the neediness is coming more from a place of desperation or like shame or guilt, like you're not giving me what I want, I'm all lonely, I'm sad, blah, blah, it's that energy. Whereas the needing is more like, I'm so happy when I'm with you. I'm so excited when we get to do fun things together. Um, you're, you're, you're like that cherry on top of my life, my already good life. And it reminded me of a, an Instagram post that I saw not too long ago. This woman was from France, I believe, and it was at the time of the lockdown of, of COVID. France was locking down. And so she just decided, okay, I'm not going to date now. I'm just going to enjoy my life the best I can during this period of this lockdown. And she went out and she bought like a couple dozen roses and came into her house. And she's just thinking, I'm just going to, you know, enjoy this time for whatever it is. But as she was walking into her apartment building, she saw a guy that lived upstairs. They never really talked before. He smiled. He saw her all happy. She's carrying these flowers. He shows up at her door. A few minutes later and brings a bottle of wine and just says hey you want to dance with me they dance they end up in a romance so it was like almost like the mindset was she was going to be joyfully living her life and she met this guy that was right upstairs well i think everything you described was perfect up to the story the okay. story is that could have just been a, a one night stand Right. And that could be a healthy beginning of a relationship as well. You know, there's a, a, a you know, it can always go either way. <laughs> right, right, right. Sex right away. As you know, my message, Michelle, is always don't, don't give it away for free. I mean, you just oh, cannot no. give it away for free. Uh, what I was just hearing somebody else talking about relationships online, basically this, the facts of, of um, 80% of the men online are not being selected by women is 20 20 percent of the alphas uh that they they look good they have a height they have success you know above all the other men and they're the women are just not picking them see the women pick the men men sort of say look at my muscles you know look at my house look at my job look what what can i do competence capability uh and, and power power in a con in a positive sense the, the ability to produce results to provide to be strong so protective. Uh, so this is these are things that women are looking for in men, or at least stimulates hormones of arousal and interest in women. And some women may feel, due to history, I don't want a powerful man. They associate power with ab abusiveness, and that's actually never are powerful men abusive if they're truly powerful. Uh, men only become abusive when they feel insecure. Uh, so some men are very wealthy and very successful, and they're in that 20% market. Uh, they look really good, but inside they are insecure. They have to dominate in order to uh, feel secure within themselves rather than be competent and capable. But anyway, we've got that 20% that look good, and they have all these women available to them. So they're, they're so available that they'll never get a – it's hard for them to settle down until they realize a, a bit more maturity that they're really missing something of value in their lives. And so they do get married, some of them, as they get older. But the bottom line is when you have so much choice, it's your brain just wants a new and different, new and different, new and different, and uh, they're never satisfied with just the same woman. So that's that's a challenge today. And, and then you've got uh, all the women online who can easily uh, get a man by, to a certain extent by being sexually available. 
but mm-hmm. they're being sexually available to that 20% and therefore those women, <laughs> he's going to go next, next. And, but there is a level of maturity where men start to wake up and realize that they want real love because there's an emptiness that follows that. Uh, that emptiness in, in many men who are successful is, is filled by addiction. You know, and by filled, I mean actually avoided. You know, you, you just have an addiction. And addiction to sex and new partners can also prevent him from feeling that void. So I know we're talking about how to get a guy to marry you and talking about what's out there. It's not all that, okay? I counsel men all the time who are successful, one committed relationship. So it does exist. It's usually as they get older, uh, in their 40s or so forth. So that's maturity for men. If you can think about uh, men, as they grow older, they get more wisdom. And they just don't have the wisdom before. They're just thinking, what can I get? How do I get it? But as opposed to what can I provide for you and take the time to get to understand her. But having said that, Mars Venus ideas have become so popular around the world because particularly more so with men than women, although it started out with women. But men are at a certain point, they're trying to figure out how can I be successful in a relationship? And I do speak in practical common sense terms of do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Why? But men have to know, but why do this? And see, you'll hear you know, one of the big things that's taught to men is today, women need you to listen. Okay, so you say that to a man, he goes, okay, I listened to her and she was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or I listened for a minute or two and then I gave her this great solution. And also, uh, there's more depth that, that they need. So I have to explain to men, and this has been a way to, a woman can understand her value to a man in a, in a sense as well. Is that when, when a man dates a woman and he provides something that makes her happy, he bonds with her. See, the whole thing about getting him to marry you is getting him to bond with you. And men don't bond with somebody who gives more to him. So if you cook me a meal, and you do everything you think I want. I don't bond with you. I like you. I enjoy that. And then it's like, what else can I get? We don't want to, <laughs> it, it, we don't want to focus too much on giving to men, but we're going to focus on giving him the message he's successful in giving to her. And that will be a foundation for me to move into when you ask me the question, what, what, what make what clicks inside of a man to propose and want to get married? So, yeah, and you were about to share your experience. That, that's the story. I'm telling you when I, why I married Bonnie. So I was married to a woman before Barbara, and Barbara's a wonderful woman, and we were married a couple of years. We dated for a couple of years, and we're learning about relationships. And at that time, I was more, um, uh, you know, I'd been a monk for nine years, so it was all new for me, and I was just sort of learning what everybody was teaching at the time, which was, Men should be more in touch with their feelings and talk about their feelings. And Barbara was a therapist and she's always wanting to do therapy on me. And I'm like, oh, I could do this. But it, it attraction will die if men move too far to their female side. And that's what happened. I just wasn't attracted to her anymore. And she wasn't attracted to me anymore. But also what happened for us is, it, practically speaking, I realized now I wanted children and she did more children. So that put a big uh, problem in the relationship. So we, we got divorced, and one of the big problems in our relationship that would show up is we, we used to go to this particular restaurant in L.A., which was um, way on the other side of town. And so we'd get in the car, and she knew the restaurant. She would give me directions how to get there. So she's saying, turn left here, go right here. So I never really learned, remembered how to get there without her being in the car because I was just so used to her giving me directions on where this place was. There's a tendency, and this is the male tendency, if you give too much to a man or too much direction even, he says, okay, I'll just do that. I'll go with the flow. See, that's a man being on his female side. It's very unattractive. It's attractive in the beginning because you feel like, oh, he's listening to you. But then it's very unattractive that you're not taking charge. And I wasn't taking charge. She was like a real take charge woman. And it was great. She was my personal assistant too. And all this stuff, take charge, do this, do this. I'm like, go with the flow. There's an instinct inside of men which never do anything you don't have to do. It's just the women you have to understand that. See, you don't have that tendency. You have the tendency to, oh, let me do more, let me do more, let me, without being asked. 
you will tend to do more. Now, where does that come from? Well, your whole physiology is wired up to be nurturers for children who can't ask. Mm -hmm. You're always got your antennas up. Okay, what, what do we have to do? What do you have to do? What do you have to do here? And Barbara was very on her masculine side as well, like take charge and get, get it done. I was fine with that. In a sense, I could be very lazy. So this efficiency gene in men, which is never do anything you don't have to do, you can also look at it from a woman's point of view, it's lazy. He doesn't do it. And, and every woman in, in her 40s and 50s that been with men, you know this is what happens is men start out gung-ho because it's new, it's different, it raises their dopamine, that raises his testosterone, he moves forward. And then once he's achieved his goal, he relaxes. Okay, I've done it. Now I can go for a vacation, so to speak. And that's his female hormones come into play. We talked a lot about in our interviews the male hormones and the female hormones. Well, the female hormones is doing what you like, just doing what you like. And so now I'm going to do what I like. I've done the hard stuff. Now I can, in a sense, retire from the relationship <laughs> for having to make the, the do things for her. Now I knew the easy stuff. Uh, and, but he still, if he's capable of having a relationship, he has to have a sense of success in his own life where he feels but, you know, I can be happy without depending on a woman. I'm quite capable and I want more. I want a woman in my life to fill that hole, fill that void. There's a void that we have without femininity and we need it. Uh, so anyway, so here I am having divorced Barbara, a year to heal. I go back to Bonnie. And by the way, I dated Bonnie before Barbara, but I didn't have a job at the time. So she didn't want to marry me. So it was all a beautiful love story. But anyway, I got to come back to Bonnie and not sure if I wanted to marry or whatever, but I remember the moment that I decided this is the moment I want to marry her. I, I was in love with her and I was taking her to a resort. And at that resort, there was going to be a talk, you know, both like seminars and whatever. So I, I, we were going and it was south of LA. And somehow I took the wrong turn and ended up to a sign saying, Welcome to Nevada. Okay, Las Vegas. Okay. So <laughs> So I think of the wrong turn. There was no way we're going to get to the lecture okay. And uh, and I absent mind in this while I'm driving, talking, whatever. And so in my previous relationship with Barbara, I was mentioning her needing to give me directions and whatever. The, the other side of that is when I was absent minded while driving, she would get very upset at me. How could you forget? Why can't you do this? Why didn't you do that? So, that was a problem in my first marriage is she'd get upset when I was absent-minded. And that was, I was too far on my female side. It was true. So here I am dating Bonnie and took the wrong turn and I'm already ready for the woman to just be so upset with me. And instead what happened is I pulled the car over when I saw the sign, I said, I think I took the wrong turn and there was no response at all. In my brain, I'm ready for the rejection and the disapproval and how could I do that? It was important to get to that mm -hmm. meeting. And the reaction she had at that moment was, uh, and this is, I'm going way back, so take me a moment to get there. And she, I pulled the car over and, and Bonnie took a deep breath to relax and she just said, I don't know where we are either, but this is the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen. And, and I literally wanted to kneel right down there and say, thank you, God, will you marry me? And I didn't, but that's the moment I decided I wanted to marry her. And it was a place of my being vulnerable and her giving me the uh, affirmation that I was a good guy, even though I make mistakes. So that's all just to underline, women don't realize how powerful their approval and acceptance of a man is. Approval and acceptance and you have to watch those times when you're giving him messages directly that he's not good enough, you disapprove, you're upset with him, or watch the indirect messages as in the case of the couple where she was talking about how great it would be to have swimming pool with a diving board and he felt he could never give that to her. So these are two examples of men getting something that's very important to them. So just as a man needs to get what's really important to him to make that commitment, he also needs to get a message from her that this is for the couple that's in love or they're dating and they've been together a while and he's not proposing and you wanna have marriage. The obstacle to getting married at that point is men don't logically understand why do I have to do it? Uh, I just, 
I mean, it's so much in the sort of the male culture. I was just uh, watching an interview with a, a famous comedian, and he doesn't get married. He says, "What's the point of getting married? I mean, a problem's going to come up. You're going to get a divorce. You're going to lose half your empire. Your life is ruined." I know so many men that are bitter about that and whatever. Uh, so at this this age, if that's an issue, being very open to a prenup would be wonderful. Just to know uh, that is very significant because if you're talking about 40s and 50s he's not only got the logic holding him back of well what's the point of it it's just a piece of paper why do i have to the government control my life you know this is between you and me we love each other it's a very good logical argument from the male point of view he needs understanding of the female point of view to motivate him to bridge that gulf and sacrifice his own desire to be independent and free and make that commitment to you and men have that ability. Okay, we're the ones that go to battle and give up our lives. We just have to know that it's worth it. That's all it is. Our resistance is, is it really worth it? And we have so much negative messages in our culture of divorces where men lose so much. Mm -hmm. That's painful. And so why should I have to take that risk? Because we love each other. So if we both love each other, why can't you trust it will always be there? Why do I have to do the a prenup, for example? Prenup is only, from my point of view, it's a good idea to do if you're beyond the age of having babies and children. I mean, if you have children, uh, you should, you've should you created a life together and you should be together. And, and when I'm saying these things, it's just my ideas. It doesn't have to always be exact what I'm saying. It's such a, every situation is so unique and different. But the general trend here is you've got a man, he's got children, uh, he's got a, you know, family members, and they're all waiting for his to die and get his money. And so, so if somebody comes along, she's going to get the money. It's, it's just horrible. It, it brings out the worst of people. Uh, and, and now he's got to deal with that. And it'd be so much easier if we just had our own life together. And my children aren't going to be upset with me if I marry somebody else. And in many cases, the children are upset, particularly their girls. Boys, if you have boys, they're not as upset. You know, they, they're not feeling so dependent. And some are, uh, particularly if you have a lot of money, they're going to be more dependent on it, ironically. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, people get greedy when there's more money. So this is just human nature. All these dramas and history. So these are all obstacles you have to be aware of. And when a man presents those obstacles in conversation, you say, that's true. And that's true. And that's true. And I see that makes sense. And that's a good idea. You don't want to fight the logic of those ideas. It's good logic. It makes sense. I understand it would be so much easier. And that's your magic word. And marriage is like really important to me. And the reason it's important to me is I need to feel that sense of security that comes from that piece of paper. Yes, that piece of paper. It says to all of our friends, that we're happy and we're fulfilled. For you, having a lot of money or success in your endeavor is very important to you. I put my books up behind me. I want people to know, look what I've done. Okay, you can trust me. I'm capable, I'm competent, I work hard. I'm someone you can rely on. These are all qualities of masculinity to make us feel loved and important and special. That's my specialness. What's my specialness as a woman? Okay, it's primarily, it's not that I can make all this money and all these things. That's the male side of her. The female side of her is the quality of her relationships. Little girls have always been, you know, this thing, even though they're trying to deny this and push this down for so many women, it's about relationship and love and marriage and ceremony and celebration. And everybody knows I have arrived. I have a man. Uh, the joy it brings me is I have a man. For example, you can, you can bring me flowers on Valentine's Day, and that's great. I love it. You can bring me flowers all the time. That's, that's great. I love it. But on Valentine's Day, if I'm working in an office and you deliver the flower, have someone deliver the flowers to my desk, it's a double bonus. Everybody gets to see that I got flowers for my husband, okay? It, and it, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a feather in her hat that he did it for her, and it's a feather in his hat that he did it for her. We have to understand the dynamics of this. And so much, and you want to be proud of your life. You want to feel you have a beautiful life. You have a beautiful relationship. I'm not being hidden. Uh, I'm not a 
uh, you know, just a companion who for sex, you know, is often uh, a very diminishing feeling that a woman can have uh, because one of the major motivations for a man to have a relationship if it's not to have children is to have the, the the love that he feels in having sex okay sex is like a doorway for men uh to feel love uh, for women sex can be can be wonderful if she's in a loving relationship and whatever otherwise she can come it doesn't matter uh because she can find love in so many different ways you have to realize love is it's a feeling we have and it's dependent upon the biology of estrogen and women typically have 10 times more estrogen than a man and in the sexual experience they have 20 times more estrogen than a man and that's love that's that feeling of surrender and openness and safety and feeling good feeling approving accepting appreciating all when you're having positive feelings your estrogen levels are going very high and men can't have that experience Okay, so the only time we have that experience is connecting with a woman whose estrogen levels are going very high. That's why sex is so, so valuable. And, and I'm not saying every man is this way, just most are, okay, most are. There's many men who've given up on sex, they've given up on that, and they're not that motivated to get married. Uh, one of the, re I, I, I'm 71 years old, I have friends and they're not that motivated to get married, they're all divorced. Not all, some of my friends are divorced, they're not going to get married because they stopped having sex. And, you know, they say, John, you're talking about sex all the time. I don't want to hear about it. There's <laughs> this happening down there for them. Um, mm -hmm. because and particularly as you get older as a man, nothing happens down there or less happens down there quite commonly, unless you have a woman who's loving you. When you have love in your life, a woman appreciating you, you're not know, taking Viagra. You need, a, you need to be in a relationship where someone loves you and then that energy comes back. Uh, so we need women. I mean, that, that, that's why men are driven so much by sex is that on a higher level, our soul, we need love. We're here to love and feel joyful and happy and fulfilled and serve and selflessness and be free of our own selfishness. And love helps us to do that. And so men tend to be driven by sex because sex, he feels to say when you're aroused you're fully feeling and when you're feeling then you can feel connected and if you're feeling connected uh to someone who's loving you then your heart opens so we need women to open our hearts uh now not all men know this okay <laughs> this is a lot of self this is introspective of for women to know what men don't even know about themselves and the dynamic there is, and I was mentioning to you, Michelle, finally we finished the with the course with my daughter at MarsVenus.com uh, on understanding men. And one of the subtitles and one of the modules, the online course, is the problem that solves all problems. Now, what's the problem that solves all problems? It's men's need to pull away from being interested in a woman. Okay, he needs to particularly he needs to be independent and find his independence for his testosterone to go up. So women do too much for him or women spend too much time with him. What comes across is he doesn't get his own independence, time to be separate, time to miss her. Now, my wife right now is in another country. And she says, do you miss me? I said, well, not yet. <laughs> That's not my name, you know. I'm enjoying my, my space with not having to do not having to do anything for anybody, but just doing for myself, okay? So then, but I will miss her soon. And I, when I do that, the, it will be off the chart sex again. Uh, not that it wasn't fantastic. You know, it was, I just, I know distance makes the heart grow fonder, particularly for men. And men don't know this about themselves and women don't know it about men. The more she can feel fulfilled, fulfilled through her other relationships and then need him to take her to a higher level and not that needy thing, but just to be able to enjoy him and realize, wow, this is so special to be able to have physical intimacy with someone and share my life with someone and be there for someone. So again, what allows a man to make that commitment? This is all big, big story to analyze that one question, but I think it's a very important one and, and, and people may not know, but I also have a book on, uh, Mars Venus on a date. I think it's right there. It's Mars Venus on a day where my finger's pointing. In there, there's a whole chapter on various words to use uh, 
to communicate your need to have him marry you and give you the ring. And if, if I can encapsulate it, it's you, if he's not doing it and you sense it's not going to happen, and generally as men get older, they don't do it because there's no logical reason to do it. Uh, when younger, you know, when you have children, there's a logical reason, and this is our culture and so forth. The older it's like, hey, we love each other as long as we're getting along. Why not? That's just weakening to a relationship. Men have to make a commitment. You can't give him that lecture saying you need to make that commitment. Right. <laughs> you can make, as you can talk about yourself, which is when we've made this commitment, and I trust you, but I also have insecurities. And I know that if I don't have marriage, I'll start to close up and I'll always be waiting for a younger woman to come along and sweep you off your feet. And that's my immature, irrational fears, but they exist inside of me. We're human beings, we're frail, we're vulnerable. You know, we were, you know, when you see that guy bragging about his Corvette, <laughs> he's just like a teenager saying, look, I'm still a guy here, you know, it's coming from a place of insecurity. We all have insecurities and doubts and whatever. So we put those forth and, uh, or we do things to ensure that we're not too, too vulnerable to other people. And that's appropriate. We wear clothes, but when we can be fully vulnerable with someone, we take off our clothes, so to speak. And that's very natural. And that's very fulfilling because you feel like I can be myself. But to be that vulnerable for a woman, she needs to feel much safer than a man needs to feel. So you don't understand what it's like. It's like when you drive, you notice that I drive in a different way. It's because I have insecure. I, I'm more aware of what can go wrong. And this is what a woman's brain is plagued by. Is There's no awareness of everything that can go wrong. Men typically have more dangerous accidents and so forth because they don't anticipate what can go wrong. And if everything's fine now, why do we want to change anything? And so it's up to her to communicate to him in a way which is, you know, I, I know you're not ready to get married. He's given you all the reasons. You're right. I, I can see the logic of that. And then you say, and well, from my side, I just know how good I will feel because I have these insecurities that sort of hold me back and I want to just be able to open up and surrender you know, and 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 I think it would make our relationship so much better. It's something important to me. But I also understand your side of it. And then let it be. Let it sit. Don't say, so when will you give me the ring? So you don't do that. There's a time to do that. I've <laughs> done this many, many times. So I'm, I'm, I want to give you the sense of how to communicate something that's really important to you. When from a man's point of view, he doesn't see any logical reason why to do something that could be a risk for him, you know, which is this idea I covered before, which is how devastating divorce can be and, and so forth and the rules and the logic and how it affects our children and so forth. And his own insecurities, he's been probably married before too. And he saw the woman he loved become somebody else. You know, what happened to the woman I fell in love with? And he has no clear understanding of how he contributed to that. So he can feel powerless. This is most of the case for women, it happens even more so for women, they have no awareness of how they contributed to the problems in past relationships. That's why your classes and courses are so important. Uh, and our website, Mars Venus, is so important. Uh, because if you leave a relationship and don't see how you contributed to it, and not from the point of view of a bad person, I, it's just like, I didn't realize this. I didn't realize this. Like so many women have told me, Gosh, if I had known what I read in your book or in your class, I wouldn't have, I could have ever done everything differently in that relationship. I just didn't know. And why didn't I know it? Because men and women are different. So giving your partner what's going to work for them is not instinctive. What's instinctive is to give them what works for you. So if, if, if what works for a woman, for example, I know if I give a lot of attention to my partner and do nice things for her, she's going to do nice things for me. Done. And, and that's the golden rule, right? We, it's just such an instinctive thing, which is if I give you what you need, you'll give me what I need. It's a reaction, a reciprocity. But what a woman needs most is not always what a man needs most. So you're giving him what you would want. For example, often one of the mistakes when to make in the dating process, and then I do recommend that, that book up there, Mars, Venus on a Date, it's a good book. I talk about all the mistakes women make to break the bonding process, uh, which would be like, let's say you're going out on a date and you're dating and 
you want to create conversation and you know that if a man is asking lots of questions of you and is interested in you, you'll be more interested in him. That's what mom told you. You know, if you want somebody to be interested in you, be interested in them. So you're just following the wrong advice. If you want a man to be interested in him, reveal yourself more and more and he'll be interested in you because you are interesting. But asking him questions about him makes him more interested in himself. Something right. Right. And you know what, John, I had one of these relationships back when I was in my 30s. And this was kind of an on again, off again thing for about a decade. I would have these hours and hours long conversations with this man. And, you know, we shared all kinds of things and had all of these deep conversations. But a lot of it was me asking him questions and really deeply understanding him. And I fell in love with him, but he didn't fall in love with me. He loved talking to me. Yeah, yeah he feels better about himself. He's got an audience. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's my profession. I feel good on here that <laughs> talk and talk. But it's not like with my partner, to bond with a woman, a man has to penetrate her. He does that in many different ways. He does that one by listening to her more and seeing who she is and going, gosh, I want more of that in my life. Another one is he does things for you. And you respond to what he does in a way which is better than anybody else in the past, you know, which is, oh, she's delighted by me. Oh, she likes me. Oh, she enjoys hanging out with me. Oh, she's having a good time around me. And I'm part of that, you know, I'm creating the conditions for that to happen. Then he bonds with you. So he bonds by providing. That's the whole thing. He bonds by going inside. And again, that's what the bonding process of, of sex is, is, he goes inside of her, not her going inside of him. So there, there's a real balance there, which is very masculine and feminine, which you want to support as many ways you can. And, you know, we've done other talks about, and, and this is in the Beyond Mars and Venus book you share, showed at the beginning, which I just think is one day will be the classic because it takes us beyond the ideas of men are from Mars, women are from Venus, which are all very, very important to understand. But it's so easy in our modern time for women to get lost on their male side and for men to go too far to their female side. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn how our relationship and communication skills can bring a man back to his male side and help a woman come back more to her female side. And it's a woman revealing something that's important to her and asking for it that causes a man to provide for her and then bond with her and want to do more. So. It, you know, when these things are not instinctive, it can be a little confusing. So I want to tell them a, a little story of asking and getting, because you're asking a man to propose to you. You're not proposing to him. You're asking him to propose to you. Right. So, and this is very meaningful to me that you provide a special evening sometime and surprise me with a ring. That would be really nice. And that's ap after he says, I don't know, and gives you all the reasons. And you basically go, that's true. That's true. That's true. And I'm a woman. And I all these needs inside it, these feelings. And I, I know myself. I know that if we're married, I feel like I I just won the lottery. And if I'm not married, a part of me feels like, well, I guess I didn't win the lottery. And a man wants to meet help you feel that. And so there needs to be some if it goes on for a few years or a few months, you know, it should be you know, a few months you want to and he still has to tell you, think, then there needs to be tears, okay? It, there needs to be, you know, I know you love me, I loved you, but I just, well, I need to feel that I have that security and I want other people to know that we're married. I want to feel the dignity. I want to feel like I'm not just, you know, some person being used and I know I'm not, but what other people think? People think, you know, they go, why are you with him? He doesn't want to marry you. So, and then he might say something like, well, why do we care what other people think? Okay. And you say, that's true. And there's a part of me that does care. It doesn't like get it. That's true. So you keep coming back to that's true. And you have another perspective and, and revealing, you know, I have insecurities. And, you know, that's why I like romance. It reminds me that I'm special and I'm important. Otherwise, I feel like I don't exist. I, I need that. And you're not coming from, I need that. I, I, I have to have that. I'm so unhappy with that. But that's something that I need. Okay, now having having said all of this, I, I give a little example when I first realized this power that women have, okay? So there I was, and it was many examples I could come up with, but here I am uh, 
providing for my family. I've got a, a, two little stepchildren, two little girls, and, and now my wife has a baby. This is my marriage with Bonnie. And I'm working really, really hard and eight hours a day, plus the drive, counseling eight women a day. <laughs> it was a big job. And I'm oh. really exhausted and tired. I just want to come home, watch TV, go into my cave or whatever. And my wife is accepting this until we learned how to start creating special times for us. But we, we figured all this out. It's in all my books, but this—the point I'm making here—is she. She would, she'd say to me, John, on your way home from work, would you pick up some milk, or milk for cereal for the kids in the morning? I said, sure, why not? And as I'm going home, my my mind is still focused in the workplace. You know, that last client or the client before, or how, what went wrong? How do I fix this? Or having that problem? You know, my mind is very busy solving problems. Milk is a very low priority, so I forget, and then I forget again. And then I forget again. So I've forgotten three times. And my wife is sort of making, not making a big deal out of it. She says, oh, will you do it tomorrow? Will you do it tomorrow? And, and so there I am on the, after the third day, she said nothing. And I was watching TV and I was tired. And I was walking to the bedroom. And I remember her just following me. And she says, oh, John, uh, would this be a good time for you to go to the store and get milk? And she was really very, very clever. I was like, a very neutral child, would this be a good time? And I went, it was obvious I was going to bed. I went, honey, I am so tired. I just need to go to sleep. She says, okay. And she followed me in. And she, I was sitting down in the bed to take out my socks. And, <laughs> and she says, it would just be so nice if you went to the store and got the milk. And went, Oh, honey, I, I, you know, you know how hard I'm working right now. I'm just exhausted. I'll do it tomorrow. That's the first moment where she could have said, "You said this three times before." Right, right. Put it down. She didn't. See, that would come across as disapproval. I'm bad. She's good. You always want up. Do your best to pump a man up. And she said, "So, she said, I just, I'm so tired. I'll get it tomorrow." And she says, "That would be good, but it'd be so nice." If we had it for the breakfast and you did it, you did it in the morning, you did it right now. And I gave him, oh, I'm tired. I'm going to, I don't know. I just rather go to sleep. And and she just listened, didn't make me wrong or anything. She says, I know you're so tired. You work so hard. Pause. And I'm thinking, good. I'm getting away with it. Good. I don't have to do it. See, you're just giving him space to allow those feelings to come up. Remember, men are lazy. You said <laughs> that. And I don't mean in all senses, give me a project, I'm a super hard working guy, but if I don't have to do it, that's the, the male thing. And if I don't have to make the commitment, that makes everybody happy, that makes everything easier. But if it's worth it, I'll do it. So this is what's called a man's grumbles. I was grumbling. And you have to be aware that men grumble and it doesn't mean the same thing as when a woman grumbles. So let me explain this more. So she said, it would just be so nice. I'd love it be you could have cereal in the morning for the kids. And I really, I, I don't want to do it. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I promise I'll do it tomorrow. And she says, oh, that would be really good. And it would be so nice. See, this is called the art of uh, assertiveness it is repeat 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 you don't have to give more arguments you don't have to tell him what well, you haven't done it before you should do it or you have responsibilities as a husband you're the father you have to you told me you would do it. those are all reasons that weaken your position and they only are negativity you just have a nice position which is what you like and what you'd want after hearing his point of view because when you do this two or three times it would just be so nice i don't know it just it's Okay, so this is me. This is the untrained me. I'm not that way anymore because I've been trained, but this was how, and I was a good guy then, I'm a good guy now, but I react, okay, okay, I'll just do it now. And my first reaction, nothing satisfies you. I didn't say that out loud, but I'll just do it now. I don't, I don't want to, it's like barking. Now, when I'm barking, when a man barks, you use the metaphor of a dog barking. Now, I've got a big dog. And barks, 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 and tail is wagging. The <laughs> dog's tail is wagging. The bark is not dangerous. If a woman barks, there's no tail wagging. Right? See, <laughs> if a woman barks, if she grumble, I'm all right, I'll do this, but I shouldn't. She'll never forget it. This is bad news. She's going to hold it against you. You'll be punished for that. I mean, this is, 
So when a man grumbles, it's kind of like he it's an immature way of, of saying, this better be worth it. Say, all right, I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it. It, it, that's that's it, it, it. See, it's a primitive part of it. Not even words, but the words it's saying is, "Well, this better be worth it. I don't want to do it, but I'll do it. But it better be worth it." So, so what do you mean? What it better be worth it? He doesn't know what it means. It just has a grumble, but that's what it's saying. It better be worth it. And what is the reward that he's looking for? He doesn't even know. But it better be worth it. And what's worth it is that you're happy to see him when he comes home with the milk. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's the reward. He doesn't know it at the time. Everything, you know, we, like a woman can be upset and talks for a while and she doesn't know it, that she also has a lot of positive feelings. What is, he's got a grumble bit, but take action. And when he takes action, he, he goes to the store. So I remember going down the, ah, I don't want to do this marriage, you know, responsibility. You know? I mean, yeah, he got right. So, and I'm in my car, make a loud noise. Better be worth it, you know. This is not easy for me, you know. I'd rather be in bed. That's what I'm doing. And this is immaturity. I get it, but it's 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 all I'm trying to give you understanding of a man's grumbles. And so, as soon as I'm going down the hill in my car, I'm driving my car. Now, driving my car is a goal. I'm achieving my goal. I'm getting the milk. All whatever a man is achieving a goal, and where he's got a destination, he's along doing that. He's on his way to do that. Testosterone goes up and his stress levels go down. The grumbles are gone. They're gone permanently. Not a big deal. He gets the milk. And, and to make a fun story, it's really true. I arrived at the store. I say to the guy at the counter, I'm getting some milk from my wife. No reaction at all. I walked up to another woman and said, where's the milk? I'm getting some milk from my wife. She goes, really? In the middle of the night? You can just see the tone of her voice. What an amazing man here. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting some milk. <laughs> Get the milk. Get the, the milk down. I feel like I've like achieved some great goal. I'm getting in the car. And now I'm racing back to show her I got the milk. Complete transformation. Okay. It's like eager to please. He's the guy that knelt before you and said, will you marry me? You know, I, I want to please you. But I had to go through the grumbles first, just like many women will come to my therapy sessions and talk about their feelings and come back to why they're married and their love in their heart and so forth. By talking produces estrogen for a man doing the deed, doing the deed, anticipating a reward. Okay, I have to anticipate the reward, builds up testosterone and I feel good. So now I'm driving back, I got home. I said, hey, I got the milk. And she gave me a big, thank you so much. I know that big deal for you getting up in the night. And that was it. Didn't it had to be a huge deal. But was, she gave me a big hug. And it, inside, her mind might have been thinking, he made such a big deal out of this. All he did is go to the store. I asked him three times. And, but wait till I tell my girlfriends, well, we'll have a good laugh. But she didn't say that. She truly went, thank you, thank you so much, and gave me a hug. And so I remember forever. And the story even goes on further, is that when I was getting up in the morning, she had already been up with the kids. And right when I walked into the breakfast room, <laughs> right that moment, the kids are pouring milk under this there and she, they're getting the milk for their cereal and they go, yay, we have milk. And Bonnie said, yes, your father got up in the middle of the night to get that milk to make sure. Uh, see what a sweet thing that was. It's 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 a feather in my cap that I did that. And that is a woman, it's a feather in her cap that she has a partner who will respond and do that. Now, she could have said, yeah, I'd ask your father three times. Finally, he did it. <laughs> then, yeah, right. you're, you're wanting to train a man that you are they have the ability to appreciate his efforts he puts forth. He's not always perfect. So you have a neutral attitude to the imperfections and a positive attitude towards the, the good things that he does. And a lot of women will be well, he doesn't do that many good things. You know, that's because you're not asking him. You're doing whatever you're doing more for a man than he's doing for you. Because you say, oh, you know, he's not giving back. Stop giving and with a neutral tone, start giving more to yourself so you're happy, so you're not depending on him to change before you can feel good. And then ask, ask for more in small increments, getting men to do things. You know, we've all had, you know, maybe like resistance to going to the gym or something, but once you get into it, you enjoy it, you like it, you know, you get out there. It's like sometimes I don't want to go out, I got a dog, I got to, I just like take her out. And now I'm out there, I'm enjoying the morning, it's all great. So we have, we all have resistance. Just think about a man and proposing is a lot of resistance to it. So you gotta wear it down. You gotta give a lot of support. You gotta let him know that, you know, marriage is so important to you. And are you thinking about getting married? You know, I would love to get married. 
And I know this isn't as romantic as we all want it to be, but we're older, we're wiser, and and we understand the obstacles in our world today. You have to realize historically, marriage was something that a man had to, uh, could not have sex until you said, until he promised to marry. That was it, you know, the old wisdom was, the culture said women, you can't have sex with men, men, you can't have sex with a woman unless you marry them. Well, as soon as, you know, we have birth control and free sex, all of this motivation to be married uh, becomes less and less. So what controls it now is how happy you will be. I'll just be so happy, you know, I still fantasize. I still have a little girl inside and uh, fantasize with wearing beautiful white silk dress and having our friends around us as we make our pledges to each other. You know, it's my fantasy, I want that as well. Okay, I, I hear you and he might say, or he might give you the reasons, always let it be. I, I, that's true. That's true. I get it. I hear you. And I have my side of this. Then as the months pass and he hasn't done anything, then you have to be honest to yourself. These are not manipulations. This is communicating your truth. If we get this far and he hasn't responded, then you have to lean into it with a very strong message, which is, honey, I just find myself closing down. I, I want to open up and I trust you're the one for me and everything, but, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to pressure you to get married. I want it to come from you, but at the same time, I want you to know that my ability to enjoy our relationship is becoming more difficult for me. And it will help me so much to keep my heart open and to grow in love with you. And that's the phrase, it will help me to keep my heart open and growing in love because I love you so much. But this is something that's so dear to me and important to me. It will make me so much happier and more relaxed to know that. And he, could, and he might say, but why? Why does it matter? And I say, well, what I've read about women as well is that estrogen is the hormone that makes us feel happy and estrogen is produced when you feel safe. And the testosterone is the hormone that makes men feel really alive. And it happens, goes right up if they're somehow in danger. Okay, so it's like you drive fast, you get more testosterone. That could be one of the things that produces it. But for women, safety is so important and having that commitment and having it be known to others is such an important thing to me. And that's why I mentioned it before. And if the kids and everybody's upset about this, one of the ways to handle that is we can have a prenup. And and the prenup, uh, some women I talked to, I talked to a lot of women about these things over the years. and. Some women are looking for a man for financial security. They they want that if he passes on, she wants to make sure that the life they built together, uh, that she has some financial security. And the, of course, his children are all wanting the same thing and everybody's wanting the same thing. <laughs> and, and so, so a prenup in that situation is very helpful for the children, but it can also be based upon assets and resources that exist here and what we create together as our life that's separate. That's one way of looking at it. Another one is making the division right there, which is I can provide this this part, uh, which is can be for us. But there needs to be some allocation of my life before my children are going to feel entitled to. It just makes things easier. But there's something for her. Now, in some cases, I counseled women who they're not really looking for that financial security. They've been professionals. They have a job. They have some resources. They own a house or whatever it might be. And they are very fine with saying, prenup for both of us for what has happened before and we create a life here together. And you can always take resources from what you have in the past to help build what you have in your life together and nobody can know about that. So <laughs> your kids don't have to know about that, but you certainly can't, you know, give your house to your new partner if your children are expecting that house, which is one of our best, and for many people, one of your best investments ever is the home. Somebody told me a long time ago, John, whatever message you make, it's all the house because the house stays there, the property's there, nobody can take that away from you. But don't take my financial advice. <laughs> That's not my gift, but my relationship advice certainly is helpful. Yeah, but it's a really good it's a really good point because both men and women, especially as they're a little older and may have been in or out of marriage or marriages and may have had the financial impact of that influence them. That is a factor that's going to be in the in the mind of a man and oftentimes even a woman. I mean, one of the things um, in working with some women, you know, in 50s, 60s and above is there's a lot of successful women out there who have assets as well. And so I do think this becomes a consideration 
not only for men, but also for a lot of women, this whole financial, how do you combine the financial assets? And of course, there are you know, I'm I'm a big believer in marriage. I, you know, I always wanted to be married and I've been married to my husband now for 16 years. There's a lot of people out there that don't necessarily even want marriage, but they want some kind of like formal, at least verbally said kind of we're in an exclusive relationship or commitment. Although I think there's a lot of benefits from being married. To me, it is more than just a piece of paper. To me, it's like all those things you said. It represents, you know, we're together in the eyes of the world. For me, it feels like a, a recognition and a respect for who I am and for the relationship that we're both committed to. For me, it feels much deeper than a, a piece of paper. But everyone has their own different way of looking at that. But I think this whole idea of, you know, you have to recognize- Let me interrupt for just a second. It, the paper, when we're saying a piece of paper, it's a symbol, it, it's literally an address. It says, we are committed don't think about having a relationship with my spouse. We're together, you know, don't violate our commitment. It's something we're broadcasting out that we are not available to anybody on an emotional level. That's very, very powerful. And, and, right, yeah. right, absolutely. And you know, if a, if a woman really, really loves a man, it makes her more insecure because she, saw, she sees how desirable he is to other women. <laughs> it's, whether he is or not, just the fact that she thinks this is the most amazing guy. And when you get guys uh, who are in love with a woman, they tend to be, some of these men are obsessively jealous because they know every man wants her and I've got her, so to speak. These are, uh, you know, the makings of romantic novels and everything like that. But, you know, some, you always see in these novels that women read, the, the jealous man, but the attraction to that until you realize how bad it is, is if he's jealous, it means he really wants you, wants you so much. It's desire, but at the same time, controlling someone that way is not a good thing. You know, we need to be upfront about our feelings. Well, that's a whole other topic, which is we could do that <laughs> dealing with people's jealousy. Uh, but it's a big topic. Ultimately, no. jealousy. If I just say it, jealousy is thinking somebody's getting something that you want and you're afraid you can't have. So you have to look up and, and rather than just judge how bad that person is, or, uh, you have to look at what it is that's making me so upset about my jealousy. If you're looking at someone, you're doing something here, or you're not spending time with me, you're spending time with her, or she's, you know, the jealousy inside of us comes up and we tend to immediately blame someone or control them and say, you can't do that. And that just pushes them further away and makes me unhappy uh, if I'm pushing someone away. So we have to realize Jealousy is a feeling that comes up inside of us that covers over a vast uh, amount of other feelings. Uh, another phrase is, you know, our our mind is like a, a house with many rooms in it, but we're only aware of one room. I'm jealous of you, but there's other rooms too. And jealousy will get stuck in that until you go below that. You realize the other reason I'm jealous is that person is getting what I want, and What's wrong with that, you know? It's only I'm afraid I can't have that and I'm not getting that and I'm afraid I'll never get that. So that's what you go to your partner to say to help overcome jealousy is, you know, when you're doing that, I start to feel insecure, like I'll never get that or I don't get that and I just need reassurance, I can't get that and this is what it would look like for me. I have a million different solutions to it, but sometimes people get obsessively upset about, you know, your partner wanting to talk to an ex-partner or, a man looking at another woman or a woman looking at another man or another woman praising another man. Uh, in various types of jealousies, they can just destroy relationships unless we take responsibility for the, the vulnerability that's behind the jealousy. Because jealousy is often you're wrong and you need to change as opposed to when you do that, it embarrasses me, I'm afraid what I really want and I'm afraid I'm not going to get it or I'm not getting it. So. Let's create a situation where I can get what I need and talk about what works for you, what works for me, be reasonable about it. Because this comes up in relationships a lot, which is where but a man, men are attracted to women. <laughs> okay? And then that's why we want to marry you. Okay? We're attracted to women. And when a woman feels beautiful and feeling good about herself, you look at it like, oh, well, that's beautiful. Like a, a woman would look at a flower, you know, look at this beautiful flower, this beautiful statue, you know. Just <laughs> I remember being in the Louvre with body. And my 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 wife and 
uh, we were looking at the Venus statue, one of these beautiful statues, and Buddy reaches up and touches it. And I go, yeah, she can do that, but I can't. (laughs) (laughs) Keep your hands on Venus. Keep your hands on Venus, okay? So that's... (laughs) so our thing is that we were being a Hawaiian woman walks by in a string bikini. All the men look. I, I look for a brief period of time. If I look for too long, my wife elbows me and we chuckle. Okay. And then I put my attention back on her. Uh, to understand like, it. on the blinder. <laughs> you know, my, my joke about this is you'll see all the men t- glancing over or looking. It's like, you know, if a big man comes in, if Arnold Schwarzenegger comes in in a bathing suit with his muscles gleaming because he just worked out, everybody's going to look, you know, just like that's unusual. That's amazing. So a man will look, his tendency, his primitive brain goes, oh, and there is a part of the primitive brain inside of a man that says, oh, if a woman's undressing in front of me, she wants to have sex with me. And if she wants to have sex with me, that means I'm an alpha man. I'll go with that woman any day. So there, this is all pre right wired inside so what we do as human beings is we don't indulge in our lower self but we don't judge ourselves for becoming aware of it and then shifting consciously shifting you know there's that the big discussion is where and this also kind of plays into our, our theme of how to get a man to marry or get him to propose if you have a good relationship maybe a little extra push in there is another resistance a man has which is they can have and what keeps men from getting married some men is well we're designed there's this whole thing out there in the world like men are designed to have many women okay historically men have had many women and we have enough sperm to make babies every day you know women can only make one baby for nine months okay so we're designed to do it many times for many places and the biology is such which which by the way we know in different cultures there are women many women, one man, but that's because there was a shortage of men. You see, cultures are smart. You know, there's a war, the men all die. What? Who's going to take care of the women? So the guy who survived, the king, whatever, he's got lots of women. Okay, then it becomes a status symbol of how many women you have. But the women are like, great, he can he can take care of us. Uh, and they would all take care of each other. These are different cultures, different times. What we have now is the possibility of being in a monogamous intimate relationship where love can grow to higher levels than ever before uh it's the intimacy to be able to find yourself in another person that's an amazing experience see as a man to connect with a woman i can find my feminine tenderness by connecting with her while i still stay this very strong uh confident capable non-vulnerable at all nobody can affect me i mean you can come shoot me the bird you can criticize my talks i okay <laughs> at the same time i'm a very sweet vulnerable person with my children with my wife with the people i care about i'm in touch with my feelings and so forth but i don't take things so personally that's masculinity don't take it personally at all and yet also be in personal relationship i know how i got there it wasn't always that way it was by being in a relationship and respecting a woman what that means is when a woman can be feminine and you respect that. So much of what's being taught today is, you know, women, you need to respect the man and everybody deserves respect, but it's women who need the respect the most. Respect is what you yield to someone else. You know, when I'm uh, honoring them, when I honor you and do something for you that maybe I don't want to do myself, but I'm happy to do for you. You go to the speed limit, you respect the speed limit, you respect the laws. Respect means you can't just do what you want you do something for them and that's respecting someone and femininity is what we want to respect most and what we want for masculinity you appreciate you value it you can you say oh i have a need and you satisfied it see it's 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 not so much doing for him what he wants although you want to give him what he wants but the priority is giving him recognizing what does he want what he wants is for you to appreciate his actions for you so it's always this reciprocal thing it's not easy to first conceive of it because certainly i want to be respected people respect me all over the place i love it but why do they respect me because they value what i can do for them or have done for them so that's the male side that wants to be valued the female side wants to be valued and so much of the time women will feel oh in our surveys and companies and everything women feel they don't feel appreciated or valued mm-hmm. and but if they, the reason they're not feeling appreciated, that you can find reasons for it. But at the same time, we did a survey in the workplace of men 
This is 100,000 people in the survey. And well, men and women's complaints about each other's and whatever. And for women, do you feel appreciated by men in the workplace? And 75% of women said they don't feel appreciated by men. Okay, and we asked men, do you appreciate women in the workplace? And 90 something percent of men said, yes, I appreciate the women in the workplace. So it wasn't that men didn't appreciate women in the workplace, it was that men didn't know how to communicate appreciation to women in the workplace. They're appreciating women the way we appreciate each other as men, which is good job. Whereas a woman feels appreciated when you take time to uh, hear her perspective, value her perspective, uh, and include her, you know, this inclusiveness people are wanting now more is respect me, honor me, let me be seen. And, and that means more than just good job. That means what do you need? Are you being paid fairly? And that's respecting a person's needs, honoring her needs. And so she'll communicate, I don't feel appreciated. And men are like, what do you mean? So many women will say to their husbands, I don't feel appreciated. Change the language. Instead of going, I don't feel appreciated, you know, I'm equal to you. I deserve respect. And what I need in respect is for you to do this for me and for you to do this for me and you to do this for me. That's what worked for me. And, you know, I remember Aretha Franklin coming out with the song R-E-S-B-E-C-T. The women went wow with that, wow with that. See, it's like, you know, men get plenty of respect and we all need respect. But in relationships, and I see again and again, is what opens a man's heart is not when women are doing things for him, although that's nice. But the big thing is when a, what a man does for her, she values and appreciates. And it used to be so much easier for men and women to get along because women really needed men to provide money. And men provided money and women provided love. And it worked very beautifully when a man could provide the money. Now, in a, a culture where men can't provide enough for their family, it makes men alcoholics and drug addicts and so forth because they don't feel good about themselves. So he has to be able to provide, but when a man can provide, then a woman can appreciate. And then what you have is the making some a great relationship. Yeah, and if he's not providing financially, if she's not depending upon him financially, then one of the key ideas that you're bringing up is there are other ways that he can show up for her, that he can yes. provide valuable contributions to her in her life. And Michelle, thank you so much for pointing that out. Because that's the whole essence of my book, Beyond Mars and Venus, is if you don't need a man for the money, what do you need him for? To become aware, I don't like being lonely. I don't like being at home. I don't like eating out all the time. I don't like cooking for myself. I want to cook for somebody else if you like cooking. You know, my wife says <laughs> she likes to cook, right? But, but if I don't eat it, she goes, well, I just won't cook for myself. It's fu it's nurturing. Women have a nurturing side of they They want that in their life. Is it, you know this is going to enrich my life and i want that i need that i appreciate that i'm looking forward to that that's important to me but to me that's not enough where a woman really needs to find an awareness if she wants to have a good relationship is the awareness that i need a partner who can empathize with what i'm going through i need a partner who i can share what's inside of me and feel understood and I need a partner who is there for me on an emotional level. And that's why so many women will go with other women today. Uh, one of the reasons, okay, is that men don't know how to hear a woman. And and I'll just say the benefit of if you're, you're a woman who wants to go and share with other women, they all will sort of relate to each other. You get that safety to express yourself, but you're missing something. You're connecting with other women you're now connecting to half the world. Mm -hmm. You're still disconnected from the other half of the world. The experience of having a man, a man's world, respect you and value you. You're no longer disconnected to half the world. You're connected to the whole world. And you're also connected to your whole self, which is your own masculine and feminine side starts to come up in harmony together. So this is the beautiful thing about having a man. When a man can really understand where you're coming from, and hear you and validate you, it feels so, so good. Now that all sounds great. I just know how difficult it is. I just have to say this, Michelle, which is so many women who are confident and capable. And, and as a woman ages, she becomes more confident and capable and self-assured and I can handle everything. She's more on her male side. And how does the male side process stress? 
It processes the challenges of life. Well, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, that's the life. There's no problem. Well, I can't do anything about that. Well, I'll solve that problem. Well, I can do this and I can do that. That's how you solve problems or feel good on your male side. So what you find is women <clears throat> will tend to have this experience of life of being overwhelmed. I have so many things I have to do. I have to do. I have to do. Men have much less of that. 30 years ago, they had none of that. Uh, when men were men, they work hard and then they forget the day. They go home, forgotten, done. I can, we have breaks. You see, our male side says, okay, I've run, out, I've run out of fuel. I need to rebuild my fuel, my hobby, my relaxation. I've got my me time. I'm going to do it. Then I've got my wife and my children. It was so mapped out easily for them. And But when women are on their male side and not on their female side, meaning your work is not nurturing, you're working for money, you're setting goals, you're achieving goals that you, you basically feel I have to sacrifice to do that. I'm doing what I don't like to do. I don't like what I don't want to do. Whenever you're on that side of you and you feel like I have to solve this and do this and it's too much, that's your male side. Your mm -hmm. female side comes back. How to come back to your female side. There is a, a there's a concept in the ancient days of called rhythm, which is everything that goes left will go right. It's to go this way, it will come back. And this is a natural coming back. So if you go way over to your male side, way over to your male side, then to find balance, you just can't come back to here, center. You, you can't go from way over here out of balance to centered. If you're way out of balance this way, you're gonna to tend to go way out of balance that way <clears throat> over to your female side. And when you go way over to your female side, it's embarrassing. Female, way on your male side, female side has very little logic to it. <clears throat> That's where you feel, I, don't, I need you to reassure me. Do you love me? Do you care about me? Am I important to you? And a guy, well, of course I am. <clears throat> Why would I marry you? He doesn't really understand the need that women have for reassurance that they're loved, that they're special, that they're significant, that they're important. Even though, you know, over here on their male side, oh, I make money, I achieve goals and whatever, that makes me feel special. But what if I just, who I am? This is very important. The female side is, do you see me? Do you hear me? But she doesn't even see herself. That's why therapy has become such a big thing for women is we therapists will help women to understand, well, what's frustrating you? What are you afraid of? Why are you feeling anxiety? Why is it you're not sleeping? What's going on inside of you? What's going on inside of you is a host of emotions, emotions like anger and sadness and disappointment and frustration and, and, and guilt and shame and insecurity. And I'm getting older. I'm not as pretty and nobody wants me. And will I ever find love? So all these insecurities are inside of there. That's estrogen. All that is a estrogen, her female energy, which is being repressed, suppressed during the day. It's pushing down, pushing down. But when that pendulum swings back, then suddenly it starts to come up and then she pushes it down or she rationalizes that as judging her partner. Well, you're not doing this for me. You're not doing this for me. All of my negative emotions is about my partner. This is all basically Freudian ideas. It's very important to understand is that if you, if you have stress building up during the day, when you come home, it gets unloaded on the person you feel safest with. And that's mm -hmm. your partner. <laughs> Just, it, it doesn't say, hey, these are my feelings about work today. No, it's like you didn't pick up after yourself or you forgot to call me or you didn't do this. Couples get upset about the littlest things because they're not dealing with the stresses of their day or the stresses of their past, which are creeping up on them or your partner does something like an ex the slightest little thing and you kind of have the reaction that you didn't fully heal from the past. So relationships are challenging. The more older we get, the wiser we get. We just have to use these skills. And the way it then looks is <clears throat> everything I say has to have a practical aspect of it. It's Venus talk. You know, it's, I'm, I just, I want women to know that just having the romantic side of it is not going to get him to marry you. It's when he can feel that he really helps you. He really helps you. And if you open your heart to him and say, it's just so good to be able to talk to somebody at the end of the day where I can just say, you know, my, I was giving this whole presentation afterwards. I just felt terrible. I'm afraid I didn't do the right thing. I could have done it better. And then he'll say, oh, no, you do a good job. He said, no, no, you don't have to fix anything. Just hear me. Just hear me. It feels so good to just be able to unload and come back to my, my, my feelings of insecurity. And see, as a post I'm so confident, you know, and I'm so secure. The female side of us has so much more fear than the male side of us. 
the male side of us is so much lazier. <laughs> Remember, I'm talking about that. The female side is insecurity. And, and to reveal that, and it's kind of like, I just need you to hold me and hug me and tell me that you love me and, and say those things. And another thing that I'm, you know, when couples have better communication, they can do this, what I'm about to recommend is here you are, you're in a romantic relationship, you're most of you are having sex at that point. Then when you're having sex, to be able to talk during sex and to say at another time, and sometimes you have to do it another time, you can do it right then, but it's good because people aren't prepared for this. Men aren't prepared for this. To be able to say things like, do you love me? Will you tell me you love me? Am I important to you? Why do I, why do you love me? Every love story is like, do you love me? <laughs> it's like, oh, let me count the ways I love you. You know, this, this is pretty much what men can learn to do. And you can just say, just tell me, then you love working hard and supporting me. Tell me you love me always, even though it seems corny. For some people that would be corny and, and making love. I'm going to just say, do you love me? And just say, yes, I love you. And I always love you. And if we just get logical, I can't say I'll always love you. I, I don't know what the future is going to be. Nobody can really say that logically. But emotionally, it stimulates my estrogen hormones. It feels really good. And, and so, will you always love me? Do you love me? Are you sure you love me? This is very sweet uh, asking for reassurance. And that was something I didn't get in the first 10 years of my marriage to Bonnie. I finally got it. Uh, that women need, re as much as I want to, if I've got some stocks on the stock market, I look every day, how's it doing? I'm looking for reassurance that my money's okay, right? Right. You know, if I, every author is looking on Amazon to see what number you are, you know, how, how my book's doing. You want to see what's my success. This is male logic. If you're, you know, your business, I've got to look at my bank accounts. I got to know it. And I, I look every day, I say, oh, I'm doing good. You know, that's all. As to the male getting the, that reassurance, women need a personal reassurance. And that's what the roses are about. That's what the stroking the hair is about. That's what the compliments are about. That's what noticing is about. That's having difficult conversations. And this is an important thing that breaks couples up is that women will bring up the issues where they want something, he doesn't understand why, or it's not gonna work for him and she's trying to get more or something like that. And you have a, a difficult conversation, they come up and if you can say this magic word, women, this is another thing that helps men make a commitment to marry you, is he's getting the reassurance that he can provide what you need to be happy. So here you're having this difficult conversation. And if you can, remember these words I'm about to say, just say to him, I know this is really difficult for you, but this really is helping me. I know it's difficult, but I will get to the other side and it helps me so much. See, then suddenly he goes, oh, this isn't just a nuisance. This is just, you know, I haven't lift a heavy log to carry it over there to do something with it. See, it's like men need to feel that the effort, energy they put in has some purpose, has a meaning. And so I just cherished the moments one time <clears throat> that just changed our whole marriage when, you know, we were a bit of an argument, whatever, and I, I just said, look, I'll think about it. Let's not talk. That was what we set up because we don't escalate. Couples escalate in arguments. Mm -hmm. that's all so you have to have your exit phrases, safe, safe phrases, and mine is, all right, I'm going to think about this. <clears throat> but I didn't do it so well that time, okay? It was like, all right, I'll, I'll think about this and walked out of the room, kind of like I'm done with this, and rushed and walked away. And when I softened and came back, which men will do, that's why this class, the the <laughs> the understanding man, the problem that solves all problems is men going to their cave, making sure men go to their cave. And the many reasons it works, it doesn't work, how women sabotage it, all those things. <laughs> it's, I learned things even as we were writing the course together. But when I came back from being in the cave, I just came in the kitchen and our, our safe thing then is when I'm out of the cave, I just come around, offer to help or put, stroke her hair a little bit and maybe she's warming up or she's not. You know, you, can, you have to gently come back after somewhat of an uh, argument. And I, uh, and she said to me this thing, she said, John, thank you so much for protecting me from your dragon. Mm, well, it was so powerful because suddenly the thing that most men feel guilty about is walking away. Uh, and women then 
cry and feel hurt, you know, so we clearly have a lot of shame around walking away, but we do it to protect you. It's called fight or flight. You want to fight. It's not a good idea. So flight is a better option. So he's in fight or flight. He flights. He calms down, cools off, does what he needs to do to feel better. He opens his heart again, comes back. And so I come back and, and make my little connection to say, okay, I'm safe. John is here. The, the angry guy is not there. And she says, thank you so much for taking your time and protecting me from your dragon. Oh, I love that. That's so beautiful. beautiful. It's just a beautiful thing. And it's it, it's what I'm hearing a lot today. It, and we're trying to ex- teach young men about their masculinity and how it's been negative masculinity, toxic masculinity, and all this stuff. And this whole sort of negativity about masculinity. Then we've got a lot of male leaders online sort of pumping men up, you know, and talking about the importance of like competitive sport. That's something right now that has come up, which is a uh, danger on the football field. Mm-hmm. They shouldn't have so much danger. Actually, we need competition. Males need that competition. There, there's different degrees of aggression in men. Okay, it all has to do with basically the size of your shoulders, how much muscle mass you have. You have a, a, a you know, your primitive brain is violent. Okay, we have a whole history of violence and masculinity. We use violence to protect the women from other violent people. Okay, so there was ongoing, and now we sort of evolved into a higher mind, but we still have a violent part of us to various degrees. And the whole point is, we need to take that. We don't want to repress that violence. We want to transform it into ambition and drive for success, and to winning and doing your best uh, instead of being lazy and placated out. Well, that. Violence is a powerful force that basically propels you into action. Okay, now most violence would be if you found a, if I was experiencing a violent part of me, uh, I wouldn't act on it in the way of hurting to hurt somebody. But I can certainly feel like I want to hurt them. But then I go, but I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to figure out a more more advanced, civilized way of dealing with those emotions, as in that feeling. And some men just have more of that than others based upon their body type. And we don't want to shame that. What we want to do is bring it out in a constructive way. I did karate as a kid. My brothers did boxing and they're bigger than me. So I stopped boxing. (laughs) I got get my head knocked down, knocked down. And so boxing with gloves, you know, that was a thing. And why do so many people go to fights? Why do people go to football? You know, it's a catharsis of everybody gets to experience that primitive part of them without the intention to hurt somebody, but to win. And in the process of, I want to beat the other side, but I do it by cooperating with my team. I want to support my team. So it's training the male violent part to cooperate, which is the female side of us. The female side is cooperation and harmony and the connection, but that's just not reality. Reality is you need both those forces. You know, that if I just want to move my hand like this, it's, 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 it's shaky. It's not going to be as solid as if I put my other hand against it. Now I have a very smooth movement across opposing forces. The whole universe is a balance of opposing forces, love and hate, love and uh, aggression and, and cooperation. Okay. So you bring those two, th- two things together and you have assertiveness, you have um, transformation, you have growth, you have motivation, you have resolution, but you've got to have all these opposite forces coming together in harmony, not suppression of them, but transforming them. So um, a male on a football team, the guys on the field, they're cooperating with each other. They're also going to die younger. Okay, that That's a choice they made. They're, they're going to get dementia at a certain point earlier than a guy like me, uh, simply because they're getting knocked around. That's a choice they make and they get paid big bucks for it. And there's reason logic to that, okay? These are, most of these people come from poor families and whatever, their dream is to make a lot of money and I'm willing to give up my life, a part of my life for that, why not? We give up our lives every day to go into the military. See, men men have done this forever. We need to honor and respect it. For example, what women don't see about men is that men, they just take it for granted. We do the dirty, dangerous, difficult things without complaining. As soon as you get women out there doing the dirty, difficult, dangerous things, you got all these complaints because it's it's not what they like to do. It's not what they want to do. Men can do things they don't like to do or don't want to do it, but for a noble cause, I will do it. 
And if I have to go out there and get my head knocked around so I can support my children, I'm willing to do that. That's noble. And to take that away from men. And at the same time, we have our female wisdom that says, can we create this football field? <laughs> More safety factors in it. That's a good thing. But we don't want to shame it and make, oh, it's violent. You want to take violence and you want to put it in a constructive way rather than repress it. The same thing has to do, and I alluded to this a little bit before, is another objection men have to marriage is they feel like I'm giving up my freedom. Mm -hmm. And when you have a partner that you have, you're in love with, and there's a certain level of maturity before a man learns this on his own, but a shortcut is to hear another man talking about it. Look at your life, men. The, those guys are out there, one woman after another woman after another. And if you can't get a woman, you're online and you're doing it's emptiness. Every time you have sex with somebody who doesn't love you, or you long to have sex with someone who doesn't love you, you're feeling rejected. Mm -hmm. They're constantly saying, I'm rejected, I'm rejected, I'm rejected. You don't realize how this is ripping your self esteem apart. To find somebody that you've earned their love, you had their love, you did it, you provided it, you got it. That love is only grows over time and biologically this is true because when you have sex this is for men when they have sex with a woman they love and a woman who loves him so you have this is a married couple when they measure sex between a married couple when the man has sex he produces different hormones the hormones he produces that he doesn't produce in masturbation he doesn't produce it in sex and one night stands non-personal relationships and those relationships, it doesn't produce prolactin. Prolactin is the monogamy hormone. Prolactin inhibits his desire to have sex with other women. So this is nature. You find a woman who loves you, now your body can produce prolactin that frees you from your lustful emptiness. Okay, there's like, I remember one of the great philosophers who didn't have a great marriage, but uh, Alan Watts, great philosopher, did not have a great marriage or sex life. He, he's uh, brilliant in the end, does that went to the body, my opinion, because his statement was, finally, I'm 75 years old, the dragon is dead. <laughs> and the dragon was his sex drive, this thing that controlled him, that, that was always based upon lack of fulfillment, lack of fulfillment, looking for it here, looking at the dragon, the, the hungry ghosts, the Buddhists will call it, the hungry ghosts. <laughs> they just, they're just always hungry and not satisfied. But then you have a partner that you have sex with your whole life and it's built based upon growing in love, growing in love, intimacy, sexual intimacy is the opportunity to be in your body more fully than any other time and feel the love and give love to your partner. So it's literally, why do you go out and have McDonald's when you got the best ribeye steak at home? Okay, that's the idea. And when I had that, when I discovered that, uh, it was the recognition that, um, I'm not trying to remember, there's various times when I remember this. Uh, um, there's this place of peace that comes in you where you realize the beast was dead of looking for somebody else because I have it in my life. And, and there's just something so satisfying to know that it's always there for you. But how can you continue to feel sexual when it's always there for you? That's the reason people today lose attraction to each other is they don't have sex in a proper way. So let me give you another little bit of science here. If you have sex with someone in a monogamous relationship, you pr produce prolactin, which causes you to desire less other women and you're more satisfied in this relationship. But if you have too much sex with that person, then you lose interest in sex. But this is another research study that was done that when men have sex with their partner on Saturday night and then have sex with their partner, what happens, their testosterone levels go up and they come down to baseline. And then you have sex on Tuesday, your testosterone levels are at baseline and they go up and they go down. And then you have sex on Saturday night they're at baseline, they go up and they go down. But if you have sex on Saturday night and you don't have sex for six days, on the seventh day, your baseline has gone up 50%. So now you're engaged that day, you wake up that morning with 50% more testosterone because you didn't have ejaculation twice that week. So this is 
too much of a good thing isn't a good thing. Occasionally it's fine, okay? And you know, I'm not trying to know these are puritanical rules. You look in the Jewish religion, they will have basically, they don't have sex except around ovulation. Okay, mm-hmm. like 10 days where the man and woman don't touch or whatever, and then they could, that's naturally according to your bodily rhythms or estrogen levels about, they start to double about four days, five days after a period. So, or 10 days after the beginning of her period, that's when her estrogen levels are starting to double. double. That's when her estrogen levels are starting to rise higher where she can fully enjoy sex. So that's their understanding of it. So men are celibate for at least 10 days a month. And so that's one approach to it. Another approach is have it four times a week, but have six days in between. Give yourself a rest. Like, think about this. If you eat all the time, food's good, but it's not as delicious if you fast for a day, then it's like in heaven, you know? So my partner's out of town right now and I'm, I'm great with that because I know distance makes the heart grow stronger, it makes the penis get harder. <laughs> and it's as long as you don't masturbate, you don't release the energy. And so many couples don't understand this. If a man's not getting it with his wife, he'll go masturbate, then the energy that she needs from him, that desire energy to awaken her sexuality gets dampened and dampened. So we don't have, healthy sex skills to keep the sex going. So when I'm talking about monogamy, I'm talking about a lifetime where sex can grow and love glows, all gets better and better, as opposed to the couple who doesn't know how to have sex, has too much or not enough or does it the wrong way. What happens is sex doesn't become so fulfilling and therefore your body doesn't, you don't grow in love through sex. Your prolactin isn't produced. And now you're feeling, I wish I had that, I wish I had that, I wish I had The man is starting to lust for other women. The woman is either lusting for other men or she's not interested in sex at all. And then you get to the 60 or 70 for these men with, they sort of run, run, the, run the course with their testosterone. You'll see so many pills and everything is about testosterone for men because they lose interest in their 50s and 60s and 70s. It just doesn't come up, it doesn't get hard, it doesn't last. What to do? Start practicing space in between, it'll start increasing your testosterone and you come back to being like a young man. I'm 71 years old and my testosterone levels are like mine when they were a young man and even more. I measure them, they're 50% higher. Because uh, I, I I talked about this with you before, <laughs> Michelle, it's hard to talk about uh, things that people can do right away, but it, there's a thing where there's lots of books teaching men how to have orgasms without ejaculating. If you can have orgasm without ejaculating, that means you can have lots of sex and your testosterone levels stay in a higher level. And when a testosterone stays at a higher level, it means that a man is less moody, less pouting, less irritable, he's more motivated, he has more energy, he's more romantic, he's more attentive. Uh, all of those good qualities he had in the beginning, which were automatic for him, has a lot to do with the newness of high dopamine raising his testosterone automatically. But the newness will go away. The testosterone levels don't get that free ride. So we have to do other things, which is the one I had just mentioned, which is some abstinence in between, but always in between. You can't stop having sex. For couples that have stopped having sex, they need to start having sex and let it just be the worst sex you ever had, but be very gentle with each other, you know. And <laughs> you've got to start trying. And it needs to be ideally if the if the woman doesn't fully open up and feel uh, levels of orgasm, uh, then the man shouldn't ejaculate. He should practice, let me just get aroused and excited and abstain, because that will build his energy up, because his body will keep saying, I need to have that release, I need to have that release. And if he gets too excited, he does, he'll get blue balls without that release. But if he just moderates it, tones it down, now we're gonna start and we're gonna be a little sexual, kind of like when you were teenagers, you just kissed. I mean, it was so great. and. That we go on mm-hmm. we want the whole big thing now that's because we're addicted to high intensity so you have to use willpower and be romantic be affectionate say loving things to each other hold each other these are things that gradually will awaken up the, that energy again and again until now you're having sex and then you don't want to have too much you want to create space in between and you know if you, if you don't learn as men how to have orgasm without ejaculation then what will happen is <clears throat> as you get older you need more than six days you know, one woman said, you know, it's just like, you know, my husband is like 10 days before anything comes back. So I want to make sure we do it the right way. Mm-hmm. We have one chance. <laughs> so this is a man's refractory period uh, increases before he's interested in sex again. 
based upon how much estrogen he has in his body. So this is where your retired man does what he likes to do. He's going to have more estrogen. He has to balance that if he wants good testosterone, which is finding something he likes to do, but he has to work hard to do it. Okay, see, there has to be that working hard aspect of it and some sacrifice doing things you don't like to do, but have a noble goal. For example, I was just saying in sex, yeah, you'd rather just have an orgasm every time for a man and ejaculate. Try getting aroused and holding it, stopping it, and just don't ejaculate. Let that be a sacrifice you make for your partner or do things for her. And I'm coming back to once again, just to make this all more practical, it looks like your wife's not in a good mood. Don't take it personally and say, say, what's the matter? And then when she talks, help me understand that better. Well, what else? And all you have to do is say, well, what else? And pause. More will come. You, you think what else can come? It surprises you. You know, I, I, I <clears throat> with my daughters, okay, I, I, you know, they always say dad gets off the phone right away. And so, because I, I think there's nothing more to say. So right. I just staying on the phone. And what happened is more, more comes out of them. And then I just have to say, tell me about that. And what else? And then just pause for a little while. And then they'll say more. Or you might say a little something. But men sort of think you've gotten to the period it's done, as opposed to create a space for more to come out. And women seem to have so much more. It just keeps coming out. You know, so many things they can talk about with you. And what men don't know is when they can talk about with you, you're doing something wonderful for them. It stimulates the female hormones going up. And when a man or a father does it for his daughter, or a man does it for his wife, a guy on a date does it for a woman, it's very different energetically than if they were doing with a woman. You know, they're, they're already one with each other. But to connect with that, which is different. And for me, when they can feel safer and open up, I'm now expanding to the part of me that's feminine. But at the same time, I'm listening. That's masculine. Masculine is listening. Most people don't realize that. When you're listening, I'm hearing you speak. I'm penetrating in. And so like right now, I'm, I'm very much in my female side because I'm sharing what's inside of me. But if you notice, I tell stories, which is sharing me, and then I make a point, a logical point, solving a problem. So I'm problem solving my male side, and then I'm also sharing. That's bringing the male and female together. Doing hard work, but also enjoying it, is the blending of masculine and feminine. Uh, going on a romantic date for a man is... He's not doing necessarily what he wants to do tonight. The main thing he wants to do is to provide something for her to be happy. And what she's doing on that romantic date is not something to make him happy, but something that he can do for her to make her happy. And then from a meta's point of view, or stepping back, by enjoying the date with him, you're giving him a great gift because women do want to reciprocate. But I want women to know that when you enjoy what a man does for you, you have reciprocated. You don't have to do more. A lot of women don't want to feel obligated. You know, they're going on a date. Everybody wants sex right away. Whatever. You don't think, you don't feel obligated. You give them a great gift. It's like, you think she had a debtor? Does that mean he has got sex with you? It's absurd. But we will often feel like, well, I want to split the meal so I don't feel any obligation. No. Let him pay for the meal. Do anything possible to get him to pay for the meal. Get him to go to the bathroom so he has to pay for it. And, and it says, look at that bill. Don't touch the bill. And if, if he if he doesn't judge it, then finally, you know, you just be be with it, ignore it. And then finally you say, well, should we split the bill? And, uh, and, and, that, and that's fine to do. But the ideal is keep creating the opportunity, but don't pay the bill. Well, let me pay this for you. Uh, it's just you're on your male side if you're providing. You're on your female side when you're responding with appreciation, with acceptance, and with trust. Those are your key things. And anytime you want to throw in a little admiration, that's really good. See, these are subtleties of love. When I said the word admiration, easily that could, when, so, when a man says, I want respect, what he's really saying, I want to be admired. When he's saying, I want to be respected, I want to feel valued. And when men don't feel valued and they don't feel admired, what you hear from them is, I want to be respected. I'm a tyrant. See, all tyrants are demanding respect. I bow down to me. I want respect. Kiss my ring. <laughs> this is, I'm above you. They're, why do they do that? This is the simple psychological phenomenon. 
uh, basically such low self-esteem that I need you to pump me up. And that's, that's the kind of reassurance that is when a weak man is looking for that. So what I, and certainly we should all respect each other, but at the same time, women need it more and then they will appreciate men more. And what men need most is to be valued and appreciated. When, when a performer on stage, everybody claps for them, they bow. See, I bow to you, you appreciate me, I will bow to you. And these are, this is for an intimate relationship. Historically, if you look at class systems and someone's working for you, what was, people were told, don't, don't say thank you, don't appreciate them. <laughs> mm. As they, they will now get lazy, they will get lazy and, and but, with a man and a woman, if you appreciate the things he does for you, he won't get lazy. But if you show your appreciation by doing more for him rather than actually expressing appreciation, which is, oh, so nice that you're here. Oh, I'm delighted by that. Ah, I feel so so much better. Oh, honey, tonight, would you just would you just make dinner? I want to just relax. I'm worn out. He says, sure, I'll do that. Or he says, oh, okay, I'll do that. He's just grumbling. Don't worry about it. And you're training him that when he does that, uh, you're, you're gonna appreciate what he does. He'll need to complain or grumble less. So we've just done a, a big course on, on how to get a man to marry you, provide the emotional support that he needs, ask for what you want, post, persist and gentle persistence. They'll give up, but don't argue about it. And, and don't ever use the phrase, I feel hurt. Okay, mm-hmm. hurt will what not work. And you know, you're such a great listener, Michelle, that I've gone way over times. <laughs> no, this was so fantastic though, John. I'm so grateful for the extra time. And I think some of the things, you know, you and I've had many conversations now over the years and and yet every conversation, there are so many gems that come forward. And this idea of going back to earlier in the interview where you were talking about sharing your sharing and asking for what you're wanting and needing and i think women have to be connected with those needs because we can sometimes suppress them to the point that it's hard to even connect but being able to share what we want and then also do it in a way where a man can hear us we don't shut him down by making him feel like he's disappointing us or letting us down by saying well that makes sense well yeah i know that's right that's right and what I know is that I really feel that marriage is something that's really important to me. You know, that just that bridge, that and bridge and agreeing with him and seeing his point and recognizing that his feelings are valid too. I mean, like that is like a life-changing technique, I think, for so many people. And so many, there's always so many gems. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I love interviewing you so much because I go back through and go, wow, that's a gem, that's a gem. And, you know, people are so grateful when I share your interviews on my events and on my YouTube channel, I get so much positive feedback. People tell me they're brought to tears. People tell me they're listening to it over and over and over again, memorizing. Just in the last day, John, a couple of comments from previous interviews are exactly what I just said. One woman said, What John is sharing is moving me to tears. And one woman was saying, I've listened to this interview so many times that I've memorized it. And I'm just letting you know that to let you know the appreciation that's not just coming from me, but from my audience and the privilege of sharing your work out there and the difference it's making. And I know you get feedback all the time, but I just think it's really important to thank you for the contribution you're making to so many people's lives and relationships. Wow, you, you made my day and made my week. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. So heartfelt, uh, just touches my heart. Uh, that that's what you just demonstrated is that what you are doing, valuing and appreciating a man, is everything a man needs the most. And and thank you so much. And I think what I provided, just as we talked about, it, you appreciated me because I provided understanding wisdom and understanding if men can get listening is not just hearing what she's saying taking time to understand what's going on inside of her and it's such a gift that we can have for men and women i mean for you to value and the, you say these women value what i say it just means so much to me and yes the truth is 
I still have a counseling practice every day. I go into my counseling practice. I leave on top of the world. There's nothing better for a man than the feel that you can uh, make the world a better place by your actions or your competence and your skills. But you do it so beautifully, Michelle, and you've touched so many people and helped provided me to go to so many people. I'm also so grateful to you, so I thank you. Thank you, John. And I want to just remind everyone to, uh, in addition to checking out John's books, this book is so incredible. I was telling John before we started our interview, this this book is, you know, an extension of John's book of uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and going in even deeper with some of the work. And if you haven't picked it up, I highly recommend it. And then, John, I want to encourage everybody to go to your website, uh, MarsVenus.com, and be sure to check out the Understanding Men course, because in all the work that I've done, I've been doing this work for well over a decade, and I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of men, although I love interviewing John the most. <laughs> um, one of the questions that people are always asking me is, why is, a man do why is a man doing this? Why is a man doing that? What's he thinking? What's going on in his mind? What's going on in his heart? And John's work uh, goes so deep with that. And I just think you could all benefit, if this is of interest to you, This you could benefit so much uh, by the Understanding Men course. So be sure to check that out too. And then John, I also know, I just want to mention this for our audience. I also know you have a complimentary relationship course. That, yeah, that right, right like there on the front page. Yeah. It's called How to Get Everything You Want. <laughs> but don't expect to get it right away. It's telling you over time how to get everything you want in your relationships. Uh, it's very basic and very good. But uh, we spent a year and a half working on understanding men, and it's just so thorough. It was Because Lauren is a woman, right? She's been married 10 years. She's got a partner. She's taken all my ideas, applied it to her relationships. And, and taking it to another level. She knows all of women's questions about men, and so we answer them all in this class. So it's very, very, very helpful. And she, like me, is very practical. And the thing about doing a workshop, online workshop, is we wrote quizzes, we have processes, exercises that you do, and we do them for you, and then you do it yourself. So a lot to it. And then we have frequently asked questions, you know, like 50 different additional information besides what's in the videos. It's very nicely produced. I, of course, I highly recommend it. You know, as I'm listening to you, Michelle, and you're acknowledging me, what happens in my mind is my mind just reviews everything I was saying that you're acknowledging me for. And I just wanted to put an emphasis on one other thing I said, which mm -hmm. is sharing your vulnerable feelings. Many women think I'm saying, tell him your feelings about him. <laughs> like, I'm afraid, I'm disappointed, you didn't do this, you did So that just registers to a man is, I'm not good enough. Well, you, 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 you introduce him to what vulnerability is inside of a woman and sharing the hidden caverns inside of you with him that you don't share with anybody at work. See, think about when you were teenagers, you would share secrets with your girlfriends and that made you best friends. Well, when you can share your secrets with him, that brings him closer to you. That helps him to bond. And what are your secrets are the feelings and emotions that you don't share with other people about those other people. See, it, it's like in, in situations like at work, the, the copier keeps breaking. You can't just say, oh, this copier breaking all the time. I'm so frustrated. Why does it Bill get on it? He never does what he says he's supposed to do. And so, and then maybe one of your children is sick. And I'm so disappointed, yet I couldn't do anything. I wasn't there. I really wish I could be there. You know, there's a lot of other situations in your life that evoke emotions. Share those emotions with him so he doesn't have the opportunity to take it personally like he's failed you. It's like, how can I get my husband to listen to me? Don't talk about what you feel about him. Don't share, I feel so hurt, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't say this, I feel so hurt. That just pushes in the wrong way, even though in psychology they're teaching everybody's first thing is put I feel in front of it, you can say anything. No, you can't just say anything. <laughs> it's what I feel, I feel you're a bad person. <laughs> right. It's all person, get it? I don't care what you feel, you just told me I'm a bad person. So. I feel it's good for you to get in touch with what's going on inside of you. And when you get to the emotions, that's when you're producing estrogen. Whether it be positive emotions or negative emotions, you're producing estrogen. But when you can share a negative emotion with him and you're not trying to change him, 
that's where he'll hear you the most. And any intent to use negative emotion to change a man will push him away. If you use negative emotion just to share what's going on without the intent to change him, that's intimacy. But it's very, very advanced skill to share your vulnerable feelings about him with no intention to change it. And it's kind of like, hey, you stepped on my foot, I gotta tell you that hurts. But the right of me stepping on my foot. There's always, the, the bottom line of negative emotions is they are just reactions to get people to stop doing what they're doing, okay? It, it's a change, you should change. So when you use negative emotions to change someone, your ability to, your tendency to feel more negative emotions increases because they become a tool to get what you want. So you stop using negative emotions in the workplace, which women know it doesn't work. So you can easily not share negative emotions in the workplace, but they build up. And then when they come up, it tends to be projected, displaced onto your partner. So their mistakes have a bigger, like a heavier rock than knocked you down. And so you have to break that tendency of sharing negative emotions to your partner to get closer. Instead, share negative emotions about other things in order to get closer with your partner. It's so, such a simple concept. And I, I, the reason I had to say this again is so many of my clients will hear this and then they'll go home, I share my feelings with it. What feelings? Well, he hurts me when he does not, not, not those feelings. And, and I know one day you wanna be able to share everything with your partner, but it's called one, two, three. Step one is first learn how to share your emotions that are not about him. Then he can feel closer to you. It's kind of like in dating, when a woman's maybe complaining about other men, he can hear that. And the whole time he's thinking, yeah, I'm not that guy. Even that I don't recommend so much, but he might also think, oh, she's a, 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 a I made this woman run away. So be careful about sharing feelings about past relationships, but just sharing almost more surface things about your emotions, about life and other people and situations. That's very vulnerable. And then he learns, I can listen and I get closer and it makes her feel good. And, and, and what Laura would teach also in the Understanding Mink course is don't seek so much what's inside of him. It will come as you open up more. But if you're like feeling, and a lot of women feel, I need to penetrate into you. I, what's going on inside of you? And that's where these classes are so good. We can tell you what's going on inside of him. And sometimes nothing is going on inside of him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Harvard did a study on brain activity. And they tell women to sit down at the end of the day on a couch and relax. That's all I said, just relax. And women's activity increased. And then they asked the men to do the same thing and their activity subsided. They didn't, there, nothing was, what's going on? He said nothing, because nothing was really going on. <laughs> it, we are built differently. Men have a break, you know, we have our breaks. We accelerate and then we break. At the end of the day, we're done. And that's not all men today. If you have a man who's an alcoholic, a drug addict, a depressed man, a, a man out of work, he's gonna wanna talk because he's on his female side. And so don't, don't listen. Don't engage. Instead, you have to out-female him. You have to have more to talk about. So he gets into you because when he goes into you, he's male going into you rather than him being female and you kind of sympathizing and uh, empathizing with this man who is at that time is like a child. You're like a mother empathizing with him and that weakens him. If he's a little boy, it's different. If he's a grown man, he needs to be the one to empathize with you. That makes his masculinity increase. That makes your femininity increase and bonding happens. So I hope I made the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just to just to recap, when you're sharing your emotions, you're practicing, practicing sharing your emotions. Your point is not sharing your emotions about your negative feelings or your disappointments about him. <laughs> because that's gonna, that's gonna not, open him up to connect with you he's going to shut down he's going to feel criticized or he's going to feel less than or like he's a big disappointment it, How there are times there are times when it could work it just generally doesn't you know there there there's and when i mentioned before about share with him the feelings you've already told him about the marriage situation and you know he's pointing his thing he's given his point of view he said well that's true that's true and what i really like is this and if he doesn't take action, then you use emotions. Okay, you can use emotions. Sometimes men think it's not a big deal if there's no emotions with it. So that's a time where you 
you're coming together and you're not really blaming him so much because you've been talking about this, but you're going, you know, it brings up inside of me so much insecurity. See how different that is as, as opposed to, I'm afraid you don't love me as mm -hmm. they mad at him in a sense. You don't love me. You don't care about me. Why did you do that? That's pushing at him. But there's a place where you can share feelings without pushing on him because you've already been having this discussion. And and basically you're, you're saying, you know, I have these insecurities inside and marriage would help me so much. And when you don't, we don't get married, then what starts coming up is I'm afraid and I'm not good enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm getting more wrinkles. And I just feel that this could help so much. And then let it, this, you know, let it be there. So that's where you bring up. And so tears would come. If you're being real and you're in love with a guy and he's not marrying you, there's tears inside there. My dream is that we can be married and, you know, and it's not happening. If you were just going to see us as like we're dating or something, or what am I, your companion? And what, you'd have more money than me, so I'm with you if that's the case. Or you're just, you know, can't find somebody who really loves you. Because in our culture, there is what other people think. And I do care about what other people think. That's why I look at lists and I try to do the can and, we, you know, we have resumes. It's important. And for a woman, her resume, for many women, is I have a man by my side and he is there. It's just feeling so proud and proud of him, but also proud that you have this life. And people go, why are you getting married? Are you not getting married? And, and a man will always come back to, what do we care about other people? And you go, well, that's true. I mean, that's it. But there is a part of me that really, really likes it for everybody to know that I have a man who loves me so much he wants to marry me. And that and you made your point and he has to hear it. You're not arguing, you're just making your point and let it sit down then bring it back again. And each time you bring it back, if you're really true to yourself, there'll be some tears. And part of me feels just like giving up and uh, my heart just can't, my dream can't come true. And 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 I would love that. See, there's beautiful feminine feeling that comes up if you let it come up. And so tears sometimes are very helpful and motivating and changing. Just don't use it all the time. That's your secret power as women, just to know that. But if it's used too much, it has no power. Did that, that come across okay, Michelle? Did that come across okay? Yeah, it did. And what I love about this is I think what you're really doing, John, with your work and what you teach is helping to create a win-win scenario where both people get to get needs met and get to feel valued and get to feel love and where we can really communicate and, and form connections. And one of the things I love about relationships and this work studying in work of uh in the area of relationships is there's always so many layers to this you know like like i was saying we've had so many conversations and yet there's so many nuances and details and the things we talked about today a lot of new things a lot of new things you know having conversations with you brings out more michelle and this little piece you might do is a little short one is how to get a man to uh share his feelings now in that subject what we have is a whole group of women going, I just want a man to share his feelings. Yes. Oh, he doesn't open up. All of those women, in my experience of 50 years doing this, those women are not very good at opening up. If a woman opens up and a man can feel successful in providing support for her, her need for him to open up becomes much less. Because at a deeper level, Women want a man to open up because they're insecure. They're afraid. What's he thinking? Does he love me? Does he care? Is it, Where's the relationship? Is something upsetting him about me? I want to know what that is. And so something could be upsetting him about you. He's a little bummed or irritated. You're, you're going to go in and go, well, what is it you're feeling? And if a man has wisdom, he's not going to tell you because whatever he says, he knows it's just going to disappear in the wind in 10 minutes. It's no big deal. It's not a big deal. Just give me some space. I'll handle it, minimize it, and come back to loving. Men can do that. We do it by saying it's no big deal. If we start talking about something and say, well, I didn't really like the way you said that the other day. Well, why didn't you like it? You immediately go into Terry. Well, why didn't you like it? I didn't mean this. You shouldn't have felt that. And, don't you? and, and suddenly he knows we're going to be in a big argument. So why doesn't he open up? Because he doesn't need to. See, he doesn't, he can be bothered, bothered about something and he can just forget it. He can rationalize it. Well, nobody's perfect. She's having a bad day. She's not that way all the time. I love her. Sex was great. Everything's fine. Okay. So men, men have their way of processing things. It's called analysis. 
It's not sharing what's inside. Now, sometimes we need to share what's inside. There's no doubt about it. And that's why sometimes men need that. But that's not their primary thing. The primary thing is to open their heart by analyzing a situation, recognizing I'm accountable. I'm making a big deal about this. I have unrealistic expectations. And this is a man who has any sort of self-esteem and confidence can do this. A man who does it, he's going to be upset and he, you don't have to ask him to open up. He's already going to tell you what he's mad about. He's going to be upset. And every time he talks when he's upset, he will become more upset. Once he's put his word out there, he now has to defend it. If he doesn't have to defend it, he can process it and let it go. We have this whole idea that men misbehave and men are not good because they're not in touch with their feelings and they didn't cry enough as children. Okay. now. Let's just put this in its category. Yes, if you shame a little boy when he cries, it's gonna have a, a negative effect on him, without a doubt. It's a minor effect, a minor effect. The reason men who can't feel, who are dysfunctional, if I, I've taught in San Quentin prison, these guys do not know what they're feeling at all. They cannot get. They can act on anger, they can act on fear, they have, they have fight or flight reaction, but they don't know what they're feeling inside and their hearts are not open. They don't feel compassion or empathy. That's a great extent. Criminal behavior comes from the inability to feel empathy. And everybody in psychology and they're, oh, poor boys, they didn't get to cry. And that's why they're, they're so shut down and can't feel empathy. No, that's not the reason. The reason is their mother was unhappy and their father was unhappy. They were not loving parents to each other. What a child needs is to feel his mother's love. How can a mother be loving when she's mad at her father, at his father? You hate my father. How can I feel loved by you? So it, it's a part of him is canceled out. It's when women don't love men and men don't love women, then children have all this conflict inside of them. It's too painful. And so they shut down and they can't feel. It's not that somebody didn't there. So it is, oh, what are you feeling? What are you feeling? It's basically they're, they're deficient in love. They're deficient in security. They're deficient in encouragement. All the qualities of love are completely deficient when parents can't give that love to each other. So and, and people want to, oh, poor boy, he couldn't cry. We need to get men to t in touch with their feelings. There's no question. That's important that men can connect with their feelings, particularly, particularly their feelings of love, okay? Their feelings of empathy for others. But if, if a boy doesn't have a father feeling empathy for his mother, how can he feel empathy for his mother? And if a mother is using a little boy as her source of love rather than a man, the little boy is going to shut down. It's too much pressure to be dad to husband to my mother. It's that the mother shouldn't be so needy to the child. The unhappy mother who's loving to the child is just giving the message, your father's not enough, I need your love. And that's the wrong message that puts pressure on that boy. He can't connect with females. And so it's the dynamics of parenthood and childhood that create the problems, the dysfunctional problems in men. It's not that men could open up and express their feelings. The problem for females is why they're overly picky, dissatisfied, overwhelmed, judgmental, critical. It, not that all women are, and they are to some degree, we all are. But when it's a problem, which is dysfunctional, you can't stay married, you can't think no guy's good enough for you and whatever. It's just too much pickiness. You're not coming from a place of love, which embraces people as they are, appreciates what is available, trusts what is possible, tr whether you're feeling trust within yourself. So the problem for female is they didn't get the safety to express their feelings. That's one part of it. They also didn't get a father to support them, a mother who was happy. Uh, you know, there's so many needs that we have in childhood. If I summarize it, it's in my book, Children Are From Heaven, The Primary Needs, also another simple book I wrote, What You Feel You Can Heal, your basic needs for the child inside, and we all have a child inside, but for a little girl or a little boy, what are their basic needs? Their basic needs, it's okay to be different. Don't compare me with other people. Don't judge me, I'm not enough. That's comparing. You love a person for who they are. First one, don't have to be like everybody else. Two, it's okay to want more. We're constantly being judged for wanting what we want. I mean, you can't have it always, but get the word to butt more and not get it right away. And then if you don't get it right away, you're upset. And if you get upset, it's okay to be upset. And then a parent needs to know how to empathize with that child's upset. So that's, that is an important need. That's a, you know, to, a boy can be upset about somebody and somebody says, okay, well, what's bothering you? And he can talk a little bit about it. He doesn't have to do therapy, but you know, it's okay to have negative feelings. You know, being judged for it. 
And then, then uh, it's okay to have feelings, okay to want more. It's okay to make mistakes. A huge need that we all have is forgiveness and acceptance and a punishment and judgmentalness. And uh, you're a bad child. You should suffer because of that. And, it, and it also, we need boundaries, which is it's okay to be upset, but you're still going to do it. I'm the boss. Okay. <laughs> Parents have, children have to have clear boundaries around them so much and then on top of that that's our basic our basic needs that we can give to our own self when we grow up but beyond that is that there's safety around me that mother feels safe dad is providing man and husband and wife are there together you know i've written a whole book here with warren farrell on the called the boy crisis and we just go statistics all the way down all these increasing troubles that our children are having statistical studies showing it Boys have problems, girls have problems. This book is mainly about boys, but the techniques in the book are about for boys and girls. But the problems for boys, we don't realize it, that uh, two girls to one boy graduates from college. Mm -hmm. This is dropout. This is males are dropping out. They're losing their motivation. They're losing their self-esteem. Addictions and violence is dramatically higher in boys than in girls. Depression, inability to get married, lack of happiness, is the the major issue for females okay their relationships with men are zero okay they 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 don't have that happiness and joy that if if you it ultimately a relationship can bring you at various times you're not always over oh, oh, every day is you know holiday but there's a richness of maturity if your parents don't have it you don't have it and it's very hard to get there you don't know how to get there uh, it's not present for you. So girls, if you have no father, how can you trust a man? Your father's not there. Okay. We have 52% of children in America this year do not have a father at home. Now, what happens when you don't have a father at home? It means that mom's doing everything herself. She's overwhelmed. I can't imagine. I can't even imagine doing what women do today. You know, having to earn a living, and take care of my children and take care of their health and their food and the house, all these things. You know, there, there's one woman on The View, very funny moment where she's talking about, they're talking about relationships. She says, I have the perfect relationship. I said, what is it? What is it? Well, you know, I have to get up at four o'clock every day to come do this show. But I come home, my husband is taking care of the kids. We've got three kids. He's taking care of the kids. <laughs> the house is beautiful. He's cooked. I don't have to worry about any of that. I have the perfect wife. Now I'm like, wow, that is, you're like so lucky. You're so lucky that she has the perfect wife. And then, then they say, and hey, what's the sex life? And then no, she goes, ah, oh, after child number three, we haven't had sex in years. <laughs> oh, no, of course they don't have sex in years. You can't you can be orgasmic as a woman if you're stressed out, period. It's not that way. It doesn't work. And to try to do all this and that, and that's just a woman working all the time. She's not having sex. You look at the... Imagine a woman working and trying to raise her children and, and not even having a husband to do all the things at home for her, like in that case. She's massively stressful. We have to we, no, we've created this world that's crazy. There was wisdom in the past where we had a partnership, which men did difficult, dangerous outside. Women did then that which is nurturing and supportive inside and we respect each other and loved each other. Well, we don't have that anymore. Now, I don't think we should. I mean, people have a choice, of course, whatever they want. My belief is that women can go to their male side. It's too confining for many women's souls to just be feminine. They want to feel powerful. They want to change the world. This is out of a break free. That's great. We have a culture that says you can break free. We don't have a culture that helps her realize, how do I come back to that warm feeling of safety and security? And I don't have to do everything feeling. If every woman just looks, if you're not in a happy marriage, there's this feeling that comes up inside which says, I have to do everything and I don't want to. I have to do everything. No, you don't have to do everything. You've set up your life so that you have to do everything. We have a culture that promotes women being so far on their male side that they will be on their male side, which for a woman on her male side comes out with, I have to do everything. Mm -hmm. For a man, if I could do everything, I'd be proud of it. <laughs> hey, I can do everything. You know, it's, it, but what men will do, they do what they can do, and then they have a break. They said, okay, now stop, take care of myself. What is it I need? And women don't have that automatic break. And, and now men are losing it because we've been so feminized. So coming back to trying to oh, man, get a man to open up, 
A woman says, I want him to open up. How do you get him to open up? You start showing him, you how you open up. See, that's so easy to do. If you just understand men don't know how to listen and you have to teach them. You just sentence, you know, to tell somebody, he doesn't need to open up. He can process other things. He's fine. The illusion is that men have to talk about their feelings to feel better. That's an illusion. We don't have to. We can, just like we can drink beer and take drugs and masturbate and do crazy stuff to feel better, but it's not good for you. For men, what's good is to be accountable. If I have negative emotions inside, analyze them and minimize them, rationally look at them and let go of them and come back to love. See, when you're accountable, if something happens to you, you don't hate the other person. You go, okay, what did I do wrong? Now I got to fix it and now I can make it better. That's one way of looking at the world. That's the extreme male side. And we are all blend of both. But whenever a man is lost, he needs to come back to his male side of 100% accountability. Look at what I did. Certainly you did something wrong, but what did I do so that you could do something wrong? And let me find a solution to that, which is heartfelt. Now, many men find solutions, but they're not heartfelt. Why? Because they didn't feel their mothers were happy. See, when your mother is not happy, a child feel, a little boy feels, I did something wrong. The pressure is on him. When the mother is happy, a little boy feels like I'm successful. Look, my mom's happy. I don't have to fix her, do anything for her. I can do it freely. He wants to make mommy happy. But imagine I want to make somebody happy and they're not happy. Mm-hmm. You, you feel like a failure all over. Your self-esteem crashes as a male. And that's why men leave wives, why men get divorced. It's always they men will feel, no matter what I do, it's never enough to make her happy. And why do women leave men? Because I do so much and he doesn't do for me. I give him my heart. He ignores me. I give him this. He ignores me. He's not there for me. Okay. So, so, see how different it is? It's she's feeling I get, but I don't get. He's feeling I do and it never successful. That little boy feels the same thing. I'm trying to make mommy happy and mommy's not happy. Mommy needs to go find a man and date a man. If she's not, if she gets in divorce, she needs to find love from a man. If you've got boys and if you've got a little girl, same thing. She needs to feel that I can depend on a man. If mom can't depend on a man, how can, how can I depend on a man? See, these are things that go into us as children. So, there's research just showing that like after a divorce, women are eight times more likely to criticize the ex in front of the child than a husband does for his wife and all these big like, stuff, everything. Eight times more. Eight times more. Well, your father doesn't do this. He didn't do that. Well, we're poor. He, he has all that money or he didn't give his checks. He, they're probably legitimate complaints and many times overreactions, which many of our complaints are. That message to the child creates a split personality inside. Can be very confusing to a male. I want to, I want to, my mother to be happy. So daddy's wrong, but I'm a male. That makes me wrong. I'm confused, which is good. My male side, my, it, it's very, very difficult for children. If people understood all the research we've seen with children of divorced parents, and of course, so many children have grown up with divorced parents. <laughs> it's very common today. But what is also common today is massive amounts of depression and d- dissatisfaction in life and addiction and sleeplessness and health problems from that. So we have to realize divorce is a major cause of all of this. And it doesn't mean you have to stay in a, a bad relationship. It means that if you divorce, you still have to work on the relationship so your children are not damaged by it. And sometimes it's easier to work on a relationship with an ex then be together. That is true. Sometimes you, your skills are not good enough. So at, at a distance, you don't depend on your partner so much. Therefore, your feelings don't get hurt so much. You know, as you if you get closer and closer to someone, we just naturally depend on them more and more. You know, if you lean on someone, it becomes easy to lean on someone. And then when they're not there, your feelings get hurt. And when your feelings get hurt, we have to realize now I need to come back to I can make myself happy right now without depending on them. It's just caring and depending too much. So back to how to get a man to open up. Stop trying to get him to open up. And that's in our class, understanding men. The more you ask men what they feel, the more they're going to either go too far to their female side and not be interested in you, or they're going to reject you as if you're pushing into them and you're being needy with them and whatever. It, and it's just a fun story. I remember one of my buddies who's divorced now, but an unhappy marriage. And he, we, we go to the movies every week for 50 years now. Oh, this was like 30 years ago. 
And uh, buddy, you know, guys, <laughs> friends forever. Don't see you for five years. See you, we're friends again. You know, it's not like, but somehow we keep finding each other and living in the same cities and we're buddies. So we go to the movies approximately every week, guy time. So we go see an action movie. And before that, we talk a little bit. Sometimes a little, we'll talk a little bit after the movie or whatever and say goodbye. And he was complaining about his wife. She said, she always saying, you never talk, you never talk. And he says, we've been married 10 years. What's that to talk about? What do, we, what do you need to talk so much for? Don't need to talk. And I listened to that and I said, yeah, that's really interesting. But when we get together, we always talk. And just, yeah, why is that? Because I don't care if you talk. <laughs> I talk, I talk. I know when it's come to the movies. Uh, guys will tend to talk and connect after they're doing something. See, they may play a game of tennis and drink something, casually drink, whatever. Uh, you know, you go to the bar, funny at a bar, you're not looking at the person, you're looking forward, you know, you're talking, maybe you got a TV screen up there watching a game while you're talking. It's easier for men. It's there's, it allows them to stay on their male side while they're connecting to their female side. You know, when you just look at somebody, you go too far to your female side if you're a man, and then you have nothing to say. You, you want to come back to who you are. You're masculine, but you have a female side. So if you want a man to open up, give up trying to get him to open up and realize why do you need him to open up? You're feeling insecure. You will feel more secure if you start talking and sharing what you have to say. And then women have an obstacle to that because they're afraid he'll think he won't be interested in what she's saying. And he may not be. <laughs> that, that's quite often the truth. But will make him interested in what you have to say. I promise you this. If you bring some emotion into it and you talk about something that is different from him, that he doesn't have to take responsibility for, just something happened today at work, or I saw this on TV, or I can't believe the politics of so-and-so, and they did this and this and this, whatever it is, share what you think, share what you feel. You can always say to him, well, what do you think about that? He says, that's ah, okay. Don't push further. Don't use the phrase, how do you feel about that? That's going to make him constipated. I was once doing a, an Oprah show and the guy, woman was complaining and that this is when Oprah was trying to be a therapist. And, and he says, well, how do you feel about that to the guy? And he's like, I don't know. And he couldn't talk. I said, Oprah, just ask him, what does he think about that? And boom, the guy's got all these opinions about everything. <laughs> but he's not always the go-to for a man you don't want it to be. What do you think about that? And, and then don't argue with him, of course. Just hear what he says and appreciate what the logic of it. Well, that makes sense. That's a good idea. Move on if you disagree. Not a big deal. So you, you, you basically don't try to man to be your girlfriend and you will lose attraction for him if he goes there. And many men become your girlfriend. This is called the friend zone. They always lose a woman's attraction. It's when they start talking about their feelings and they're complaining and this happened. I don't know what to do. And, no, if you want to talk about that, go to a guy to talk. And you know what these guys will say? They'll say, no, guys don't want to listen to that. Yeah, it's just, you're being too female. You're a guy, be a guy, suck it up. What do I do? Then in that case, you're too far on your female side. You journal those feelings or you go talk to a therapist and you share with that therapist. That's okay. Or go get a woman therapist. She'll love to hear all that stuff from you and realize that's your mother relationship, okay? You're not gonna have a sexual relationship with her, so that's fine. You can be like a little boy and share what you need to say to your mother or share what you're feeling inside. But ultimately, coming back to masculinity is solving problems. What do you think? Having thoughts, having opinions, having goals, achieving goals, you know, and sharing feelings is not necessarily that important unless you're very grounded in your masculine side, you don't need to share feelings. And then at times you do, but you're not coming from a negative place, okay? You're coming to share what's going on and you're not sharing fears and anxieties and de depression and disappointment. I feel so bad. You can, if you do, you, what I look at is like, when it doesn't uh, lower you down, you can say things like, you know, it's really hard, it's really difficult, it's challenging for me, but it should be like one tenth the negativity of the positivity that comes out of you. Women need to feel a man is anchored and he can handle stuff. And, and that's what makes you attracted to her and that makes you feel good. What men don't know is that every time you verbalize and you're in an intimate relationship, a negative feeling, your estrogen goes way up and that makes you weaker. See, this is a hormonal balance inside of men. Your testosterone always needs to be higher than your, testo your estrogen. It is easy 
science on this go anywhere what is a man's healthy testosterone levels is 10 times higher than a woman's what is a woman's healthy estrogen levels 10 times higher than a man's what is a woman's estrogen levels when she's having an orgasm 20 times higher than a man's okay so we just a simple little conclusion i just applied just that even to what i know about men and women it all makes sense men listen to women women open up men penetrate in same thing in sex man does the things necessary so she can relax feel safe feel loved feel beautiful feel special then estrogen goes way up her body over opens up for him to come inside that's the biology of all of this and what he has to do is make her more important than him in that process which means that he doesn't come before her <laughs> mm -hmm. it's women first you know ladies first and if you have a problem with that, men, what you can do is just give her an orgasm manually before you penetrate her or penetrate her, then come back out before your orgasm and give her an orgasm through physical stimulation, then come inside of her. So she always makes sure as assured of having the proper stimulation she needs. And generally, not all women, but most women is about 10 times more. It's a lot more that she needs because, and this is only modern women, by the way, uh, indigenous women don't need so much time. Okay, they're very multi-orgasmic uh, because they're in an estrogen lifestyle. See, they're always depending on men for protection and they're doing what they like to do. They're the raising children, they're gardening, they're cleaning, they're cooking, they're sharing, they're talking, they're complaining. You know, they do all this feminine stuff. If you ever lived with women, you know, all that stuff that goes on. That's what they do. That produces all estrogen and men are outstanding guard. Okay, they're not doing much, but they're doing what's dirty or dangerous or difficult. They're doing their male thing, they're doing their female thing. So those women are multi-orgasmic very easily. So, but in the Western world, because women are way, are more on their male side, it takes a lot of stimulation, safety, relaxation, no goal orientation to come back, oh, just relaxing and this man is just catering to you and doing things that are pleasurable and enjoyable for you and saying loving things to you. I say to men, talk in sex, tell her how beautiful she is, tell her how much you're happy you're married to her. I'm so lucky to have found you. You're the best person. And a man doesn't understand that's romance. He thinks, well, I already told you that when I married you, why do I have to keep that short? <laughs> I told you once. Yeah, I told you once. And a woman should say, if he gives you that argument, he gets said, look, we had sex once. Why do we have to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> You know, so it's the feeling. It's the feeling. Women enjoy that feeling, and men enjoy being admired by women. That was a good idea, or John's here, or he'll fix it, or you know, it's just thank you so much. All these positive messages women give just fill their life. Same thing for a woman. She, her life is filled by the positive messages he gives her. And so, coming back to the theme of this little presentation is why men don't open up. How to get a man to open up. Why men don't open up? They don't need to. Women need to open up. And usually when it's when women, when women are saying, he never opens up, I ask her, well, tell me how that makes you feel. She doesn't even touch with her feelings, you know, and get her to go deep into her feelings and open up and share what's going on in her life. I might say to her, I say, oh, well, what's your job? She says, well, I manage a restaurant. And I say, well, is, is that challenging for you? Well, it's what you have to do. Well, tell me how you feel about managing the restaurant. She says, Nothing doesn't feel anything. Uh, are you disappointed? You had to fire that person, do the shutdown or whatever. And she goes, well, you have to do what you have to do. That's business. You see, there's, she's pushed out her emotions all day long in the workplace and forgotten them. Well, she can come and share those feelings with her partner. There's so much that women can share, but the things that really produce a lot of estrogen are the things that she feels inside that are, are that she won't share with anybody else. That makes your relationship special. Just like you don't get naked in front of anybody else. You know, it's like if you're a woman that, that walks around naked all the time, <laughs> naked with your partner doesn't do anything for you. See, there's a wisdom to covering all the special spots of the body. It's saying, this is just for my partner. So then when it starts to come off in front of your partner, it's very special, it's very vulnerable, it's very, as opposed to, well, I walk around this way all the time. It's nothing. You lose all of the specialness uh, that you are special to me and that's why I let you go here. And that's important. It's a symbol. How much of your pr private areas you show has a lot to do with, I only have sex with someone who truly loves me, as opposed to, I'm gonna have sex because it feels good. Mm -hmm. See, sex can feel good and now you're just an animal. 
You're just an animal being stimulated sexually, and there's it's not for love. But you preserve that. You hold that. This is this is special. I do just with you. Why? Because the pleasure in sex allows me to feel more, and in feeling more, I can express the love I have for you that I don't have for other people. That's romance. It's special. So giving it words now starts to help make sense of some of the traditions we've had, like modesty, you know, and and revealing more to people that you care most with. That's what makes it special. And specialness is what monogamy is. So another thing where people don't understand the value of monogamy is because, well, why, why have to be monogamous? Because then it makes your sex life not special. It makes you not special. The fact that I only wanna be with you means that you're more special than everybody else. But what if, what if the truth is, I'm a man, I could be with that person, that'd feel good. Yeah, he could do that, but he reserves that energy, the sexual energy, he reserves that just for his partner. That's his gift to her. It's not like that's what you should do. That's what you, well, it is what works. Because if you give what you've got to her, she can love you more. She can feel more safe that nobody else is gonna take it away. Think of sex energy like money. If I go give my money to a bunch of strangers and there's none left for my wife, that's not good. It doesn't make her feel good at all. So you share your income with each other. And then if there's extra with money, you can give to charities and whatever. But when it comes to sex, you don't give to others. This is a precious sacred force inside of us, which is the energy, life force energy that can make babies. It can create babies. And if you're not making babies, it can regenerate your soul, can regenerate your, your love for each other. And that's what we call it, making love. We call it making love because you literally make more love. Because when you make more love, you're very connected, and then life sort of drains it out of you. When you, when life drains it out of you, what happens is you've got to make it back. Because mm. by aliveness and potency is like, imagine uh, if, if you actually measure, if I, if I put my hand on a sick person, I have more vitality than them, They'll take my vitality. You can measure the electrons flowing from me into them because they're deficient. And a lot of other energy you can measure is going into them as well. That's love energy. So if you're out there loving the world, you'll become drained. You need to replenish it. You need to bring it back to your, through your relationship. It's like a generator. It brings your love back high. And then you can freely get to the world appropriately where you come back to your special generator, which brings vitality and connection and love. So those are some thoughts that I think everybody should consider about making love with your partner, the specialness of that. And that happens when women open up as opposed to trying to open him up. And most women know that men do kind of automatically open up when they're aroused. <laughs> Their whole attitude changes, they become a different person if, if you're in a loving relationship. So basically that's how you keep opening up a man as well is by enjoying having intimacy with him, whether it be emotional intimacy or physical intimacy then men open up as they connect with the female who is open. Mm, that was so beautifully said. I love that. That was really beautiful. And I'm so glad you shared that and added that to the conversation today, because I know it'll be really valuable for a lot of people. 